Good morning, everyone. It is 9 a.m. live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith, and this right here is Yahoo Finance Live. Here is your morning rundown. We have a possible deal here. Ford and representatives from the UAW say a tentative agreement and has been reached to end the strike. It's the first deal reached between the union and one of the big three Detroit automakers. Workers still have to sign off on the Ford deal, but it's a big step forward. And it comes just ahead of Ford's earnings report tonight. In a gangbuster quarter for the U.S. economy, GDP rising by 4.9 percent during the third quarter at the fastest clip that we've seen in nearly two years. Powered all by the consumer, will this momentum last? We will take a closer look. And a new leader for Morgan Stanley, Ted Pick, a three-decade veteran of the firm, will succeed James Gorman, who's stepping down after a 14-year run as CEO. Pick already credited with revamping the firm's trading business after the downturn in 2008. What could Pick's tenure look like and what does this changing of the guard mean for Wall Street? Let's get to this morning's driver, and that is the UAW and Ford have tentatively reached an agreement after nearly six weeks of strikes. Now, the union saying that the deal includes 25 percent wage increases over the course of four years, adjustments for cost of living and the right to strike over plant closures. Negotiations still continue between the United Auto Workers Union and General Motors and Stellantis. UAW President Sean Fain called the deal a, quote, historic agreement. Ford knew what was coming for them on Wednesday if we didn't get a deal. That was checkmate. On day 40 of the stand-up strike, we reached a historic agreement. Yahoo Finance is Pras Subramanian joining us now with the latest. Pras, we just heard Sean Fink saying checkmate, a historic agreement. What's in the, what do we know about more about just what's in this deal and then the next steps here over the coming days? Hey, Shauna. So, yeah, interesting with that quote you just played. What he was alluding to was before Checkmate was that they were potentially going to strike the F-150 Lightning plant. That was supposedly the next step. And I guess that was enough to sort of uh, prompt Ford to sort to reach this deal. So anyway, some of the uh, the big sort of parts of this deal are you mentioned that 25 percent base wage increase through 2028 through the end of the deal, 30 uh, percent increases in the top wage a 68% raise in starting pay, uh, also shortening the wage progression to three years to get to that top wage, and also the reinstatement of COLA or cost of living adjustments, among other things. Uh, Ford said it was pleased to reach a deal and to focus on restarting their plants. And, and Sean Fain also saying that, you know, we, quote, we won things nobody thought possible. This agreement sets us a new path to make things right at Ford, the big three, and across the auto industry. Now, now the deal still needs to be voted on by, by, UA, by the UAW's Ford National Council. Then it goes to members for a vote perhaps a week from now. Um, and then, and then uh, uh, some Wall Street reaction, initial Wall Street reaction is, is good. Uh, our a good friend Dan Ives saying that was a balanced deal and that he expects to see other deals struck with Stellantis and GM in the next week or so. Yeah, this is really interesting, Pross, especially given the timing, UAW clearly recognizing, all right, Ford has its back up against the wall. It's about to report earnings. It could come out and have to issue some of the same statements that GM did, or it could strike a deal right before that. Do you feel like Ford felt like they were painted into a corner here and ultimately wanted to give investors some clarity about where they were willing to and ready to move forward? You know, Brad, there's probably a little bit of both there, right? So they're pain, pushed against the wall, potential strike at that F-150 plant uh, earnings today. But from a timing point of view, I was thinking about this earlier. This is such a good thing for Ford. Right ahead of earnings, they're able to say this deal is struck, talk about it tonight in the call, see, say what the implications are, maybe keep their re, keep their, their guidance, which GM had to pull. And that was sort of a black eye for them, among other things, uh, this week. So it's almost like a big win for Ford over its crosstown rival GM as it hit the deal. It's probably going to keep its uh, 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 its guidance or at least tweak it slightly and say that, hey, we're, we're done. We're going to get this voted on. Hopefully, hopefully the members ratify it and workers go back to the plants. Uh, it can't be said yet for, for GM and Stellantis, but I think that they have at least have a model template to work with. And we'll probably see these other two deals happen very shortly.
All right, we're going to be watching that very closely, as we know you will as well, Pross. Tracking ticker symbol F here on the day here, pre-market. And as of right now, we're just taking a look at shares that are up by about 2.7%. We'll continue to keep a close eye on that moving forward here as we get closer to the start of today's trading activity. Also in focus here, big tech earnings. They were supposed to save the day for equities. But the fire under stocks created by AI hype in the previous two quarters seems to be fizzling out here. Last night, we heard from Meta, and despite being on the top and bottom lines, a murky macro outlook left investors wanting now. The stock is extending losses in pre-market trading. Our next guest says the problem is that it simply isn't the environment for investing in equities. Let's bring in Paul Meeks, veteran tech investor and the Citadel accounting and finance professor. Great to have you here with us today, Paul. Really been looking forward to this conversation and what and your take more broadly on equities. And, and it kind of is right in line with what we had been hearing from some of the other portfolio managers out there saying when you've got this much of the growth or the advance that has been weighted in the Magnificent Seven, then that creates a scenario where you could see some slippage and, and especially if that same AI hyper narrative starts to figure out, uh, fizzle out here. I want to get your read on this. Yeah, I think it's the 80-20 rule, the 80-20 rule of pain. 80% is just the realization that interest rates will be higher for longer. Now, the consensus view as we entered 2023 was that we are going to have a recession this year, which was going to lead the Fed to lower rates this year. So that was a bit of a propellant based on the discounted cash flow model, particularly for tech and other aggressive growth stocks in the first half of the year. I think the 20% of the equation is you're absolutely right. We had a lot of uh, early year uh, AI hype. And I still think it's going to be a massive investment theme. But what we're struggling to learn right now is how are companies going to monetize AI? Because until further notice, this is probably a big cost as companies train their large language models. And we may not see a meaningful bump in revenues, even for the major players for some time. So those two in combination, the biggest being the macro outlook with interest rates higher for longer, the 20% of uh, the evil here coming from a little bit of letting the air out of the AI balloon. So I think that's what's happening. But I'm worried uh, foremost about the macro. So, Paul, let's talk a little bit more about the macro, exactly what is clouding the outlook right now. When you take away, the, or I guess my takeaway from what you just said was the fact that it's enough, it sounds like, to keep the markets on edge at this point. So what does that mean then in terms of the trading action that we'll likely see between now and the end of the year? I think it's going to continue to be volatile with probably a skew to the downside. Remember, some of these tech stocks, like think about a company like NVIDIA. It tripled in the first half of the year. It has come off a bit, but not even a meaningful correction yet. So unfortunately, the sector that I follow the closest, technology, could have some more downside risk. So my strategy here, whether it be uh, Meta today or Alphabet yesterday, is if you believe in these companies long term, which I absolutely do, what I do is I begin to scale into the position and continue to add to my position until we find some solid bases on these stocks. So if you're a long-term investor, I'm cool to buy some of these stocks today, but go in slowly and deliberately. I think that that is the way to go prudently. What, what would be those solid bases? What, what would be those catalysts that you would be looking for to signal that we may be eventually seeing some type of turnaround, or at least that there's a bottom that's set in? Yeah, I think the uh, the key thing is, you know, you'd like to see companies be more bullish in their guidance for future quarters. But uh, I do, again, think that that's a small bit of it. I think the major bit is give me some visibility. I'm, nobody's going to know for certain, but give me some visibility that maybe we'll ratchet interest rates up one more time. You know, that's not uh, controversial at all. But when do we start to lower rates from this high plateau? Again, we're not going to be able to pick the day. We're not going to be able to pick the Fed meeting in which that happens. But if I feel more comfortable that that's the uh, next step in the evolution of this market, then I'm more confident 
with the tech names that I've circled up that I like long term to go in and buy them even more aggressively. Paul, well, I'm curious just from an investment uh, strategist standpoint, how you're looking at the recent data that we've gotten out because we've talked so much about the resilient consumer, the latest data that we've gotten, even the consumer staples reports that we've gotten so far this quarter have really pointed to the fact that people are still out there spending. We had the GDP number out this morning, 4.9% growth in the third quarter. What does that mean then in terms of how you think the Fed is looking at these reports and how that could potentially influence their next move? Sure. You know, I think the Fed is being data dependent at this point, because if we're not in the eighth or ninth inning, I don't know what we are for rates. They can't go much higher. But I do think that after the big push in GDP in the quarter just passed, that we will start to see a little bit of sagging. And at that point, we might have some realism. You know, some of these companies in their guidance for the fourth quarter and for 2024 are noticing these things. You know, they talk about uh, green shoots of good stuff. This could be green shoots of bad stuff, and that wouldn't necessarily be bad because then we could see some uh, confidence that uh, rates will start to fall. So I do think that we will see, unfortunately, or fortunately, from your perspective, a, a material slowdown in all these things that drive the economy as we go into the fourth quarter of 2023 and particularly as we steer into the first half of 2024. All right, Paul Meeks, veteran tech investor in the Citadel accounting and finance professor. Thanks so much for joining us here, Paul. Well, another big story that we're watching today, Wall Street's succession plans here. We know that bank veteran Ted Pick will succeed Morgan Stanley CEO James Gorman at the start of 2024. Morgan Stanley announcing back in May that Gorman would step down and select his successor from one of the bank's three main division heads. But Morgan Stanley's leadership shakeup raises the big question, who else among big bank CEOs could be passing the baton? So let's focus in here on, on Ted Pick, give the people what they need to know about Mr. Pick, formerly or previously head of equity capital markets here, also is credited with have, uh, having a hand in helping the firm raise capital during the financial crisis here as well. And so uh, a kind of storied career over at Morgan Stanley and some of the larger times in either the great financial crisis or even through the pandemic and times even between, uh, I think that's where they're kind of leading into the bench that they do have, the roster that they do have, and trying to promote from within there as well. It certainly was not a surprise. It was well signaled ever since uh, James Gorman announced that he was going to eventually be stepping down. But it's interesting just in terms of the street's reaction, taking a look mm. at some of the analyst commentary coming out this morning, just really discussing the fact that Gorman has such an influence, obviously, yeah. over the bank ever since uh, taking control of CEO back in 2010. And the direction in which he has steered Morgan Stanley. So any sort of change, obviously, could be potentially a little bit tough, at least in the short term. Mayo, Mike Mayo out from uh, Wells Fargo saying that he is a very tough act to follow when it comes to what we could expect here going forward. Uh, Mike Mayo saying that the new CEO faces a 2024 consensus EPS reset, asset management headwinds, muted investment banking, also challenges in managing peers while the ex-CEO stays on as chair. This can make for a tricky few quarters. But again, on the other hand, though, it does remove this overhang that has certainly been on the stock ever since Gorman announced that he was going to be retiring. And that was ma the main takeaway from the desk over at J.P. Morgan, just saying that they don't expect any material change in strategy. That's also something that Ted Pick has reiterated since being named CEO last night. But they do also point out that the block trading matter is still an overhang for the stock. A resolution mm -hmm. would be helpful in J.P. Morgan's view in terms of the direction or getting better clarity uh, going forward here for Morgan Stanley. But we're looking at a three-month chart. You're looking at shares under pressure off just about 24% year-to-date. The stock down about 16%. We'll see what Ted Pick does as, as a top job and how he then further uh, accelerates the company here moving forward. And as we mentioned at the outset of this conversation, I mean, this place is an extreme focus, the succession plans that are needed at so many of the other large banks here in the U.S. You think about Jamie Dimon and how he's even been looked at for some of the top cabinet or financial roles in the past for different administrations. And so with, with that in mind, there's any time in the future, perhaps, where if it sounds appealing enough, if the job sounds some, like something that he wants to have a hand on, then 
J.P. Morgan's going to need to figure out who they put into that position. They've already had some of the top brass rotate out into other CEO positions. I think about um, Tasunda Brown Duckett, who is now the uh, CEO over at, uh, oh my gosh, I want to say TIA, um, but uh, I don't want to be incorrect fully on that. Uh, TIA, yeah, actually, that was correct. Good job, Brad. Anyway, thinking about the transitions there, thinking about the transitions over at Goldman Sachs, where even earlier this year there was kind of a, a quarrel or a, a little bit of a quibble externally here about what internally was taking place at Goldman Sachs and who could potentially be a successor there uh, after uh, David Solomon. And then even more so, you think about where in all of the roles, even for Brian Moynihan, where he had been on a short list to become the next Treasury Secretary. I mean, so all of these banks need to do a clear job of communicating all right, what the leadership ranks look like, who is perhaps next in line. And I'll also say as well that outside of Jane Frazier, we don't have a lot of gender um, yeah. equity or, or diversity, I should say, or even ethnic diversity, for sure, at the top of many of these banks. Um, and considering the clients that they sell into so many services and manage financial accounts for, uh, you would love to see more of that um, and more of the DEI initiatives that all of them have put forward, perhaps net out in some new faces at the top of these companies as well. All right, I'm going to get off the uh, I'm going to get off the No, but that is a good point and we when we talk about the potential successor here to yeah. Jamie Dimon, there have been a couple female names floated, one of those being Marion Lake who right. could potentially succeed Diamond, so maybe we will see more uh, women, more females uh, taking on those leadership positions at some of the largest banks. All right, we got just about 14 minutes until the opening bell. Let's head over to Jared Blickery with a closer look at what we're seeing the action around the world, Jared. Yes, we're seeing uh, quite a bit of red here, more so than green, although we have the Dow and the Russell 2000 just barely in the green. NASDAQ down uh, 35 basis points. Let me show you what's happened this week. This is four days down about 2%. And I've been showing you uh, what's been happening in Korea. That's actually down more. Korea has been leading the global technology sector down. And when we talk about technology, let's shift back to the U.S. And uh, first of all, this is what happened yesterday in the NASDAQ 100. This is a sea of red for the most part. Microsoft at green spot had its day in the sun yesterday after its earning. But look at this. Alphabet down 9.5%, Amazon 5, NVIDIA 4, Meta 4. You don't see this uh, except on days when we're under considerable pressure. Some of this has to do with what's happening with the uh, rates market. I think it's a delayed reaction. Here's a 10-year yield over the last three months as stocks rolled over after July. This has just been shooting higher. And so I'm guessing this is more of a delayed reaction to that. We've seen mega caps kind of as a bastion of safety. But in the end, at the end of the day, when there's pressure, uh, the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater. Now, I want to show you, I'm going to show you all the stocks in the NASDAQ 100. This is how much they're down from their 52-week highs. Um, you look at the bottom row, it's just incredible. Again, this is only over one year. You take the highest point of a stock, and then you calculate how much it is down from that point. Currently, Lucid is down 76%. That's three quarters of its value in the last year. Let me show you, this is a one-year chart from the upper left to the lower right. And we can take a look at a five-year chart to see, well, there are those pandemic spikes. Uh, I think it was briefly a meme stock. Uh, nevertheless, huge downside price action there. Here's Moder Moderna. This is not some fly-by-night SPAC. This is Moderna, the, one of the uh, pandemic darlings. And here is that spike. It peaked in mid-2021, and it has just been down ever since. Here's a two-year chart where you can see it's down 78%. JD.com, China is running on its own fundamentals, as I like to say. That's down 70% over two years. And the list goes on. We can even go into uh, consumer staples, Walgreens. All right, Walgreens, uh, supposed to be a stalwart of uh, stability. That is down 55% over two years, guys. So the NASDAQ entered correction yesterday, and a lot of stocks under pressure here. S&P 500 not holding 4,200. That's a big one. So more negative events stacking up versus the positive ones here, here, guys. Jared, a lot of red there. We don't like to see that. If you can do something about that before the bell. There we go. There's Microsoft. Great. That's all I can do for you. <laughs> there we go. All right. Appreciate that. Uh, very quick. All right. Yahoo Finance is on Jared Blickery. He's going to stay with us for the opening bell. We've got all your markets action straight ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
UPS shares sinking this morning after the package giant saw revenue slip nearly 13% in the third quarter, slashed its revenue outlook for the full year as it grapples with delivery demand and the fallout from labor disputes. The, the UPS stock and shares are down over 15% so far this year. We've got John Eid, Argus analysts joining us now to discuss this a little bit more here as we're taking a look at shares year to date and we've got that pulled up for our viewers here. Would love to get your take on this, John, and, and where the company perhaps needs to give a little bit more insight into what's taking place, how this, you know, how the negotiations on the labor front, how that may have impacted them for a longer term than perhaps anticipated. I, th I think, Brad, that that was the, one of the big surprises in the quarter mm -hmm. um, was the very narrow operating margins in the U.S. business, 4.5%. Usually those are double digit or close to mid teens, but you can see what happened with the strike negotiations and with the impact that the strike negotiations had on volume. They just weren't able to lower the fixed costs as quickly. Um, we've seen volume be a problem across the transportation sector. Doesn't matter whether it's um, rails or trucks or here um, at, at UPS. Some of the comments we've heard from other industry participants though, is that volume has gotten be had gotten better as the third quarter was moving along and uh, the all important fourth quarter looked like it was shaping up okay. We haven't heard that yet from UPS, but uh, we, we, we may later today. And when you talk about that drop that we saw in volume, reducing daily volume by 1.2 million packages, can they win that back? And I guess if they can, what does the timeline do you think potentially look like on that? Um, I, I do think they can win it back, right? They, they've got one other competitor, and uh, I, you know Amazon is, is delivering a, a lot, of course. But uh, we've got a lot of faith in uh, the UPS management team, Carol Tomei. Uh, the former Home Depot CFO, I think, um, is, is very clear in in her direction, and in uh, especially with the supply chain and and, and streamlining. So, um, I, it, it's not going to come back in, in the next quarter. They said they're well prepared for the holiday season, but um, you know the dividend is still high on UPS. The valuations are low. I think they've got a clean balance sheet and a good management team in place. Uh, the sell-off could be a, a nice buying opportunity. And so you you still have a buy on this stock. So you're you're confident in the leadership team, the strategy that they laid out. You, you mentioned the surprise, which I do want to come back to the surprise on the kind of the impact to margins as a result of some of the negotiation uh, and how that netted out. Um, because the way that they had really been able to communicate that to the street was like this barbell approach, basically, where kind of it, even though it's over five years, the upfront costs and then towards the end, those are the two biggest areas. So why, why was that a surprise for the street? Um, it, it just is such a, a deviation from the typical numbers that, uh, hmm. that, that that UPS delivers. Um, FedEx has always been the lower margin operator, and UPS always had the uh, higher margins and, and and the higher cash flow. Uh, but but that may be switching around here, and uh, and that was one of the the main reasons to to favor UPS was, was because of its greater prob uh, profitability. Uh, one other note um, in in the the guidance. Brad, um, they did lower the revenue guidance. They did lower their operating margin mm. guidance. And they also said they're stepping back on their share repurchases for the year. That's not exactly the you know kind of vote of confidence that the street is, is wanting to see. They'd rather see the company step up and, and, and buy the stock at, at these lower valuations here. So, John, did these results then make you rethink your buy rating at all? And then if not, what are the catalysts, the near-term catalysts that you see for UPS shares? So um, I, I will, of course, be reviewing my rating. We, we, we do it all, all the time. Um, and, and if there's going to be more potential margin deterioration and, and weaker earnings going forward, well, that would be a catalyst for a, a downgrade. Uh, a catalyst for an upgrade would be if, if we could see 
uh, some of the green shoots that are popping up in the trucking industry or the rail industry, as far as volume is concerned, start to carry over into uh, the air freight segment of the transportation industry. All right, Johnny, great to get your perspective. Thanks so much for hopping on right after these earnings were released. Argus analyst. Thanks, John. Thank you. Well, shares of Endeavor are moving this morning to the downside. Silver Lake, a major shareholder in the company, saying that it was exploring the possibility of a, a taking Endeavor private. Now, Endeavor CEO Ari Emanuel saying that in a release, quote, we believe an evaluation of strategic alternatives is a prudent approach to ensure that we are maximizing value for our shareholders. You can see, though, the stock under a bit of pressure this morning in terms of how the street is looking at this. City saying that they think Endeavor Group going private would be smart. It's trading at a remarkably low multiple for its attractive, highly differentiated, and well-run assets. So whether or not others agree with them, obviously that's up for debate. But Silver Lake controlling 71% of the Endeavor vote right now, leading then City to say that this doesn't obviously come as a real big surprise here, given the fact that they do hold such a massive over 70% uh, vote here. Yeah, I mean, this is huge, and it would be a major, perhaps, shakeup here, especially considering the businesses that Endeavor is either a majority owner in, whether that's, you know, TKO Group Holdings, it's publicly listed, um, and then you've also got, of course, some of the other offshoots or the specializations that they have themselves, Endeavor does, in talent representation, sports operations, advisory, event experiences, management, list goes on, media, uh, experiential marketing, so all of these things, um, but Endeavor getting a huge jump on this potential this potential deal news. Yeah, and I just wanted to clarify there, when we were coming into this, that was actually how the stock closed yesterday. It was down 2%, but in pre-market mm -hmm. trading, obviously we're seeing a huge move here to the upside with shares moving up just about 21% on the heels of this. All right, continue to track that one going into the opening bell. We are inching closer to that opening bell on Wall Street. And when we think about all of the things that have been at play over the course of this week, and have come to fruition just over the past 24 hours. This is going to be a huge day of trading. I uh, could not stress that enough. You've got a deal, a potential deal, from one of the biggest three automakers here in the U.S. with the union that has essentially um, had them trying to revise or at least see in terms of their own negotiations and their labor contract that they had previously, where that needed to be revised, where there needed to be more incentives for the workers there. That's really put a lot of that power in the workers' position throughout these negotiations. You've also finally got a House Speaker in Washington, D.C. My goodness, that was like, you know, Groundhog Day uh, for weeks at this point in time. And then, oh, yeah, we're in a correction on the NASDAQ. So that all at play as we get closer to the start of today's trading activity. Yeah, I think a lot of focus today is going to be on some of those tech performers, how exactly we are trading here. We had the results from Meta yesterday after the bell. We're seeing a movement of just about down 1.5% following those results. Looking ahead to more earnings reports that we're going to be getting this afternoon. We'll hear from Amazon. We'll hear from Intel. Obviously, Amazon giving, giving us an even better picture of the cloud computing sector right now, exactly what they're seeing from their AWS business. Also, obviously, a look here at the consumer when you talk about retail and then Intel is going to give us a better uh, view on the chip business right now, what that demand looks like. So let's get over to the opening bell yeah. here on Wall Street. No, this entire week, it's giving cloud. That's all I was going to say. Giving cloud. Yes. Well, <laughs> well, we're giving you confetti this morning. We've got some confetti taking place here at the NASDAQ. We're hearing the pulsating vibes just beneath our feet. That's taking place here at the NASDAQ. You're also seeing the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange on your screen. Looks like Bitwise ringing the opening bell there. All right, let's take a look at some of these opening cross activity. And for that, let's bring in Yahoo Finance's own Jared Blickery. Uh, looks like the Dow is trying to make up its mind early in today's activity here, Jared. Yeah, so a bit of a mixed market, not seeing too much uh, action to the upside or downside in the majors. Let's take a look at the sector action materials. That's, uh, in, uh, excuse me, materials up nine tenths of a percent, followed by the interest rate sensitive sectors, utility and real estate. Then we have industrials, tech, and staples 
All of those on the top line are in the green. To the downside, communication services, XLC, and healthcare, those are the biggest losers, each down more than 1%. And XLC is the home of Alphabet. That's Google as well as Meta. You can see Alphabet down 2%, Meta down 3%. I was just going over some of the biggest tech losers uh, down from their 52 weeks high at 52 week highs and some jaw dropping uh, price action there. Comcast down 6%, Charter down 4.5%, but outside of that, not seeing too much, too many outliers to the downside. Let's check out some of our leaders. The IPO ETF uh, by Renaissance, that's down 4%, following by a gambling ETF. Uh, New York Fang, that would be the mega caps. All of those are going down. To the upside, we do have home builders. Uh, I'll take a look at the tenure in a second. SOX, that's the uh, chip index. KRE is regional banks and software. Those are in the green. So just kind of uh, going back and forth here for a lot of these, uh, for some of the sectors and uh, for some of the fringier parts of the market, we are seeing some price action to the downside. Here's the energy market that has been under uh, the most pressure this week, I believe. Exxon down another 1.2%. Chevron down about nine tenths of a percent. Uh, BKR, that's up two and a half percent. Baker Hughes, just take a quick look at the year to date. That is up 18% year to date. And then let's take a look at the banking sector. We still have some regional bank, uh, regional banks reporting. It looks like this. What's this? Uh, Standard Chartered down 10%, uh, really giving up most of its gains for the year still holding on to 3% for the year. JP Morgan down two tenths of a percent back as Bank America down just fractionally. Also taking a look at the travel sector, haven't done that in a couple days, and let's take a look. We do have Carnival Cruise Lines, that's up 2.8%, Royal Caribbean uh, up 1.6%, and just taking a look at some of the gains that we had earlier in the year, a lot of those have been under pressure as the overall market has corrected over these last three months. Just a few weeks ago, uh, we were talking about seasonality a lot, at least I was, at something that worked very well this year. Uh, but I gotta tell you, October bucking the trend, we were expecting a reacceleration to the upside and that simply has not happened. Uh, that's just based on historical patterns. Sometimes history, it doesn't run. I don't know, Goldman though was out with a note this week saying, don't hold, don't October count it out just over. yet. We could <laughs> potentially see maybe a little bit of gains here. So maybe not in October, but going forward. All right, Jared, thanks so much. Let's get to another mover this morning, and that is Southwest. Shares are on the move after the company said moderating demand and a shift towards pre-pandemic trends weighing just a bit on the business. You're still looking at gains of just about 1%. CEO Bob Jordan telling investors, quote, as we move into 2024, we are slowing our available seat mile growth rate to observe a current absorb current capacity, mature development markets, and optimize schedules to current travel patterns. Take a look at some of the additional uh, results here within what we're getting from Southwest. They see capacity increasing 10 to 12%. That was down from the prior plans of increasing that as much as 16% through the Q1 of 2024. We talk about sticky inflation. We talk about higher labor costs continuing to weigh on Southwest business. We've seen particular pressure on a number of these discount lines are being forced to offer even better sales, trying to boost uh, some of that demand here going forward. And we take a look at the stock performance over the last several months and really since the start of the year. Yes, we're looking at gains today, but shares are still off just about 30% year to date over the last three months. You're looking at losses of about 34%, so worst performer among the five largest U.S. airlines. We know they started the year on a rough note when we talk about the outage there, oh, all yeah. the canceled flights, the backlash that we then saw from customers, and now they're dealing with the fact that they could have a demand problem. Yeah, for customers that are concerned or at least thinking about how Southwest has moved past that or if they've able to been, been able to fully rectify what took place here, just do a hot search for capacity and see what they're talking about on that. And you brought up some of these points that they mentioned within this release and notably coming directly from the leadership at the company saying that they are flying the full fleet right now. They're completing the restora restoration of their network, moving into next year as well, slowing that ASM growth rate. You mentioned that absorbing current capacity capacity, mature developing markets, and then optimize schedules for current travel patterns. Now, those travel patterns, that's what's going to be even more in focus, especially in the fair pricing mechanisms that airlines are going to continue to put forward. So even beyond the holiday season, when you look at the normalization of those travel patterns, that's where for Southwest Airlines, for United Airlines, American Airlines, Delta Airlines, that's where it's going to perhaps be a leaning back into, okay, the stickiness of the ecosystem that they've created, whether that is some type 
type of rewards and relationship that they have on some of their most frequent flyers. And those programs typically, when there is a pullback in demand, you see a leaning into, okay, here are the other incentives that we can add on to make sure that if you do fly, that you're still flying with us. And that's typically where you see kind of that cycle tend to navigate, but it still comes down to capacity and how all of these major US airlines are trying to get back to pre-pandemic capacity in a year where the TSA travel throughput is finally looking like it's going to eclipse on a full year scale, the pre-pandemic marker of 2019. It does, but I do think that a lot of these cheaper discount airlines obviously are really suffering from the fact that a lot of yeah. people who are still traveling, they're favoring to go overseas. We certainly have seen yeah, the international true. component from United, from Delta, from American, really helping their results. When you take a look at a company like Southwest, the exposure, obviously, how much they rely on the domestic travel, the fact that people aren't traveling as much domestically could continue to weigh on their business, especially uh, during this current quarter, very important holiday quarter here for the sector. All right, keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. We'll be right back. The U.S. economy growing at its fastest pace in nearly two years, third quarter GDP rising at an annual rate of 4.9 percent. That marks a major acceleration from the second quarter as consumers boosted spending despite the rising rate environment. The latest data once again defying predictions of a slowdown. 
So could we be in the clear when we're talking about the economy? Joining us now, we want to bring in Bren Schutte, Northwestern Mutual Management, a mutual wealth management company, chief investment officer. Brent, it's great to see you again. So lots of questions about what this number could mean. Obviously, we know what's backward looking, but when you take a look at where we are today, the recent econ data that we're getting out on inflation, the recent data that we're seeing from consumers, what we're hearing from consumer stable, consumer discretionary companies this earnings season. How does that set us up here as we head into 2024? I, I think you hit the key word there where you said this is backward looking data and that's really, really important to think about. I think as you think about the future, um, I don't think the full impact of the rate hikes have hit yet. And so if you think about the US consumer, they've been largely insulated in many cases from the rate hikes because two thirds of consumer debt is mortgage debt. But that will eventually reprice. Credit card debt now carries a 21% interest rate. Auto loans are at 8%. Uh, you're seeing student loan repayments. And so as you continue to think about this, it's going to continue to erode the consumer's condition. And let's not forget that companies had termed out debt, which is now coming due, and those rates are going higher. And so all in all, I continue to see a challenging macro picture heading forward, uh, which to me leads to an ultimate recession sometime in the not-too-distant future. Okay, that's just what I was going to ask, Brent. Does Does not in the clear mean recession and, and how soon and how deep or, or shallow on the other side? Yeah, I, I think certainly the economy has uh, been stronger than most thought, but that comes back to my commentary about the U.S. consumer being more uh, or less insulated or more insulated from rate hikes because of the reality is that most of us have fixed rate mortgages. Um, I, I think eventually you'll have a recession. Timing is uncertain, but you're seeing these excess savings also wear off. And so I think in the next six to 12 months, you will see a recession. I still think it will be mild. But keep in mind, every time the Fed raises interest rates, you risk having a deeper recession because we don't know, and I don't think you've seen the full impact already, of the five and a quarter of rate hikes we've already had. And so still a mild recession, uh, but certainly uh, with risk to the upside if the Fed keeps hiking. So, Brent, it looks like the downside risks here continuing to grow. We already have the NASDAQ now just falling into correction territory this week. What does that then mean in terms of the pressure that we could see not only on tech, but really the broader market? Certainly, I think tech has held up the market. When people talk about the market being up, it's really concentrated in a few stocks. The broader market's actually already down. Look, bond yields uh, on investment grade bonds are 5.7%. The S&P 500 trades at 18 times forward earnings that are higher than what they were uh, previously, which I don't think is going to come to fruition. I think investors need to think about fixed income and not on the front end of the curve, but more towards the middle and long end of the curve or longer end of the curve, because I think there's good value there now. Certainly, there are tons of risks that are out there, but I think real yields on that uh, on that debt, if you think about 5.7 versus 2% where the flood, Fed's target is, which I think they'll eventually get to, you have quite a bit of room for appreciation uh, in the coming years. Do you believe that if, if we were to see uh, a mild recession, would it be because of policy or would it be because of factors that the Fed can't control? I mean, we're continuing to watch some of the gyrations in, in oil prices, at least over the past few weeks here as well, and, and knowing that there's broader geopolitical uh, tension that has and conflict that has certainly arisen that is now at the top of many CEOs' watch list right now for a matter that they need to navigate as well. I think it's a combination of all of the above, but um, but I think a, a lot of it has to do with the Fed tightening policy and then the reality that the money supply in the U.S. is actually shrinking now. And so if you think about history, when the money supply shrinks, uh, we've done that on three times on a year-over-year -year basis, and each of those led to a recession. Look, the Federal Reserve is not going to take the liquidity tourniquet they put on the U.S. economy off until they see the final embers of inflation burn out. That final ember is the labor market, which is too tight. And so if they're targeting that labor market and you start to see job losses, which this morning there was evidence and the continuing claims number that it's becoming harder to become reemployed. If that ends up happening and labor starts faltering, that's where you call it a recession. That's where I think we're going to end up. So, Brent, what should investors be doing then right now? How should they then be adjusting their portfolios or positioning themselves for the next several months? Well, certainly uh, we think about longer term here, so I don't want investors adjusting their portfolio too much. Yeah. Uh, but we do certainly make tilts. And so I, I think that thing that investors are ironically most fearful of right now is not the equity market. They're fearful of the bond market because they've seen losses there for the first time uh, in, in many, many years. And many of them didn't think that could happen. Um, but now bonds represent good value. And so I would think about perhaps positioning some there, not riding in the front end of the yield curve and moving out a little bit. 
um, because who knows where rates are in two years from now and you want to lock in some of these rates at these levels. And I don't think it's all lost in the equity markets. Parts of the equity markets, the small cap S&P 600 are already down 27% from their uh, 2021 highs. They traded 11.8 times earnings in the future, a level that I haven't seen very often in my 30 years of doing this. And so there are opportunities to tilt your portfolio. Please don't just concentrate in the S&P 500, which is the asset class that has done the best. Think about those other parts of the market that are cheap and possibly have already discounted some sort of recession. Brent, I call it BS. You don't even look 30 years old, man. Uh, whatever <laughs> conditioner, you have to skin put the creamer. Here, my my I, initials I, are BS. <laughs> yeah, look, same here, man. Gotta love it. <laughs> Brent Shu, yep. he was the Northwestern Mutual Wealth Management Company Chief Investment Officer and uh, really good procurer of skin serums as well, joining us here this morning. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much, Brent. Appreciate Thank it. Yep. Thank you. All your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Twenty twenty three rocked the markets. Nvidia, the stock has been on a tear. Silicon this Valley week. banks collapse is the second largest bank failure in the U.S. Inflation, mortgage rates, the diabetes drug, Ozempic. Now it's time to make bold decisions. Yahoo Finance Invest, the marquee event for investors seeking big ideas and bold decisions. Guided by the newsroom you trust. Don't miss it, November 7th, exclusively on Yahoo Finance. Welcome back. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live. We are live from the NASDAQ market site, and it is official. Representative Mike Johnson is the new Republican Speaker of the House, and with less than a month to work out a budgeting deal to avoid a government shutdown, the new leader has a lot to get working on. But who is this congressman from Louisiana? How did he get here, and what does it mean for the House? Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman joins us with what's keeping him up at night and what's worth <laughs> keeping on your radar. <laughs> Rick, sorry, I added in a little line there, but I imagine okay. this has been keeping you up at night a fair bit. Uh, well, I get some sleep now that there's actually a speaker. Uh, you don't <laughs> have to follow the, the, the speaker follies uh, every day, but we'll see how long that lasts. So uh, Mike Johnson is more conservative than the last speaker, Kevin McCarthy. Uh, he, uh, he, he wants to cut, uh, to cut spending along with some of the other hardline Republicans. Uh, he has opposed aid to Ukraine. 
Um, and, and we're going to find out within a few weeks whether he becomes a little more pragmatic and a little more moderate now that he actually has to get business done in the House. Uh, he probably will be. Um, because w when you're a lesser known member of Congress, it's easier to um, make controversial votes. I mean, for example, he's an election denier. He uh, he voted against certifying President Biden uh, after the 22 election, which Biden obviously won. Um, and he didn't catch a lot of flack for that. I mean, he wasn't one of the main people either for or against the cause. Um, but now, uh, you know, reporters in the Washington Press Corps are asking him about it. He has to answer. He has to answer for it. He hasn't. Um, so that that's the main question. I mean, what we've seen uh, during the last month is that the uh, the Trump or the hard right faction in the Republican Party, it sort of has blocking power or veto power, if you will. They can stop stuff from happening, but there aren't enough of them to actually make their own agenda happen. So that's, wh that's where we are. And uh, look, in order to pass budgeting bills in the House, get aid for Ukraine, for Israel, these other things, uh, parties have to compromise. I mean, this is this is the way Congress works. Parties do have to compromise. So that's the big question. Is he going to find a way to compromise with Democrats because he, he's going to need some of their votes? Or is, is he just going to be kowtowing to this small but um, veto minority that Republicans have, um, which means he could end up defenestrated just like Kevin McCarthy did by some point next year? Rick, you mentioned that he was one of the uh, election deniers. Just in terms of where he has stand, where he has stood on other policy issues, how that then could potentially shape what we see coming out of the House here over the coming year. I guess, h how do you see that potentially playing out, and how that could then maybe ultimately affect in some way uh, 2024? He's extremely conservative on social issues, yeah. uh, such as abortion uh, and things related to that. That doesn't affect markets so much. Um, I, I guess the thing that um, our audience will want to care about is um, he does want uh, aggressive sp uh, government spending cuts, more than uh, Democrats and Republicans agreed to last June when we had that fight over, uh, over the debt ceiling. So uh, is he really going to push for that? Um, and remember, um, Democrats control the Senate. <laughs> so even if he gets Republican... Uh, legislation approved in the House, a, sent, uh, a Democratic-controlled Senate is not going to approve it. And then what do you do? Uh, I mean, the Democratic-controlled Senate is not going to sign off on aggressive spending cuts. Uh, so um, are we going to have some kind of gridlock? Are we, are, are we just going to have repetitive threats of a government shutdown, and then everybody has to scramble to figure out what does that mean? Probably doesn't hurt markets too bad after a couple, for just a couple of weeks, but what if it goes longer? Or will we have some semblance of normalcy in Washington for a little while? I think that is, that's the big unanswered question at this point. Certainly it's the unanswered question. All right, Rick, always great to get your perspective. And now we're going to let you maybe catch up on a little more sleep, like Brad alluded to at the top there. Rick, thanks Plenty so to much. do. Bye, guys. <laughs> uh, we've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Taylor Swift making music history today, announcing she's going back on tour after a five-year break. Pre-sales for her upcoming tour kicked off yesterday, but a surge in demand caused Ticketmaster's website to freeze or even crash altogether. There's so much fanfare in, around the summer that has been Taylor Swift. The Philadelphia Federal Reserve mentioned the impact that her tour had on the economy. Jersey sales for Travis Kelsey up 400% is podcasting number one on the Apple charts, all because of Taylor. Yeah. Taylor Swift. For Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. For Taylor Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift is breaking the internet again. Almost one year ago, singer-songwriter Taylor Swift began a journey that would change the American economy as we know it, starting with ticket sales for the Eras Tour. Over three and a half million people signed up for Ticketmaster's verified fan presale, but only 2.4 million tickets were ultimately sold. The unprecedented demand created a frenzy that resulted in a congressional hearing against the ticketing company, all while solidifying Swift's status as the world's biggest pop star. The tour kicked off in March of 2023 and has since blown up headlines and even landed in Philly's Fed report. Analysts expect the tour to pass the $1 billion mark during its international leg in March of 2024. 
That would be Elton John's nearly $940 million record for his farewell tour, which concluded in July. Swift's Eras Tour is also expected to generate as much as $5 billion in consumer spending in the U.S. People are dropping money on plane and hotel tickets, fun outfits and merch, $75 hoodies, $55 long sleeve shirts, and we didn't even talk about ticket prices, with resale ticks selling between $500 to $7,000 a pop, and in some cases, even higher. And that economic impact has only grown beyond the tour, with Swift now rumored to be dating Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey. Ticketing platform StubHub reported a 175% increase in ticket sales after she attended one of his games. And according to fan merchandise company Fanatics, Kelsey's jersey sales have increased by 400% since that first Swift appearance. And now her team is taking it one step further by releasing a big screen adaption of her popular Eras form. Bottom line, the Taylor Swift economy isn't going out of style anytime soon. Big Thursday energy, everyone. Brad Smith here alongside Shauna Smith at the NASDAQ market site in New York City. We're about 30 minutes into the trading day. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. Stocks are falling. As big tech earnings and rising bond yields, they weigh on stocks this morning. The S&P 500 down today, and you're taking a look at that, lower by about six-tenths of a percent. 
Taking a look at some of the individual names, we've got to start with Comcast shares moving to the downside this morning. Now, despite the company beating Wall Street's expectations for the quarter and growing profitability in its theme park business, we're seeing some pressure on shares, and that's because Comcast lost 18,000 broadband subscribers during the quarter, and we're seeing losses of just about 6% right now. On the streaming side, Comcast reported Peacock, its flagship streaming service, added 4 million new subscribers in Q3, but we talk about how much that's going to cost. So Comcast losing $565 million during the quarter on that side of the business. And let's go for a cruise. Well, not me. I don't do cruises. But anyway, for those of you who do, news you can use. Shares of Royal Caribbean or Caribbean are on the move this morning. The cruise line beat profit and sales expectations for the quarter and raised its full year outlook for the second time this year. In the company's earnings release, CEO Jason Liberty said, quote, looking ahead, we see accelerating demand. That stock is up just about 67% this year, down today by about 2%, though. Our in Hasbro shares tumbling after missing third quarter profit and revenue expectations. The company also slashing its full year guidance on a softer toy outlook hip here by how consumers are spending their money. The pullback that we're seeing more broadly speaking, the Hasbro stock sinking to a seven month low when you can see losses of just about 10%. Let's get to some market commentary of the day. M&A recovery getting pushed out to 2024. There's a new report out from PitchBook this week that found that global M&A deal value reached a nearly 10-year low in the third quarter. The team, though, seeing that delaying the recovery, but is still optimistic that conditions are going to improve. According to the report, private equity sponsors have trillions of dollars in dry powder. Corporations are positioning themselves for new deals by keeping plenty of cash on hand. Also, lower private market valuations could motivate some of the well-funded uh, public strategic buyers here to scoop up some of these private targets. We talk about the fact that we have been waiting here for conditions to get a bit better. A number of the big banks weighing in on their outlook on deal-making activity, what the M&A landscape is going to look like. And I think my takeaway from what we heard from bank earnings is very similar to what we're hearing from this pitch book report. And that's the fact that, yes, it's going to be a bit volatile. It's going to be a bit tough here, challenging in the coming months. But when you look out into 2024, especially later in 2024, when we get some clarity on Fed policy, when yes. we potentially start to see the Fed more comfortable with where inflation is, could potentially back off and even begin to cut at the end of next year, that obviously is going to free up a lot more capital and likely spur a heck of a lot more activity within the M&A market. And especially what's been interesting to watch in terms of the number of partnerships that have come forward instead of some of the M&A that we would have or could have expected in a few instances. I think about Peloton and how much acquisition talk was swirling around that company. Of course, given the number of obstacles that they were mired within over the course of this year, but what came forward? It was an apparel partnership. That's what we got. We didn't get an acquisition of Peloton by Apple or Nike like some of the names tossed around. We ultimately just got a partnership. And so there are partnerships, very strategic whether it's in the fitness landscape, whether it's in the AI landscape, or strategic investments. And so companies are being extremely judicious as of how they deploy capital. And that deployment of capital, especially within the M&A landscape, could impact the number of companies that make their way into the public markets as they need that infusion of capital. Or it could also impact, additionally, the amount that companies like a Microsoft are going to invest in what is going to be the next leg of growth. $10 billion into ChatGPT. Wasn't an outright acquisition, just an investment. So all of these things considered, you could see this potentially continue to impact the number of companies that make their way into the equity markets, but also on the other side, the acquisitions as people are, or companies rather, are looking for cash, but not directly getting an acquisition that, that moves forward. Yeah, certainly. And we know that this is a critical part of the market, obviously yeah. a huge uh, impact in the, in the bank's performance. So obviously an uptick here in deal activity could potentially spur, unlock us certainly more uh, value here for the market going forward. All right, let's talk about one name on the move today, and that is ServiceNow shares moving to the upside this morning. The driver, well, better than expected earnings results. Now, the company also lifted its full year guidance as it adopts more AI ca capabilities across its product lines. You're looking at gains of just about 
Six and a half percent CEO Bill McDermott citing that multiple AI deals that the company has made and saying that it was, quote, radically simplifying the way business does business. For more on the report, we want to bring in service now a CFO, Chief Financial Officer Gina Mastantuno. Gina, it's great to see you here. So you have a huge beat here on earnings, raising your guidance, also on a key metric here when it comes to the current remaining performance obligation. Growth is standing out amid this weakness that we've seen across IT spending. How much of this is a result of the investment and capabilities that you guys are focusing on now when it comes to AI? Well, thank you so much, John. It's great to be here. Uh, ServiceNow absolutely um, had a great quarter, solid execution once again. So you're right. We beat top line and bottom line guidance pretty pretty handily this quarter, which is fantastic. 2.2 billion in revenue, up 24.5% with operating margins of 30%, which is great. We had our strongest federal quarter ever, growing 75% and some incredible customers like the US Air Force and Department of Defense. Um, and all of this strength really gave us the confidence to raise our full year guide for revenue to over 8.64 billion, which is 25% growth year over year. And at this scale, we're just so incredibly proud of the execution that is going on here at ServiceNow. What are you hearing from clients right now, Gina, in terms of the, the spends that they're putting forward? Because one of the huge metrics that I know our viewers pay close attention to is when you're on the call and talking about the number of deals that are coming in at $1 million in that net new uh, ACV. And so wh where are you seeing that spend propensity or where is that perhaps pulling back? Yeah, so what, what I'll tell you is the trend that we're seeing is that businesses are looking to consolidate vendors and really standardize on a platform that has core product offerings across the enterprise. And they're looking at companies that are able to drive very fast and quick return on investment. And so ServiceNow, the productivity efficiencies that we're able to help drive are really enabling companies to add significant value um, exponentially increase productivity. And that's where we're, where, where we're seeing spend. IDC talked about um, spend for IT growing at about 8% next year with software upwards of 13 to 14%. And they're talking about Gen AI really forecasting $3 trillion in spend between now and 2027 with the generative AI being 36% of the total AI spend. And we just launched our first AI SKUs just the last couple days of the quarter. And we already have over four, we had four deals land in those last two days, which is pretty incredible. And customers like NVIDIA, Teleperformance, real estate companies, CBRE, and one of uh, large US government agencies are early adoptive of our, of our Gen AI SKUs. And, We've got strong pipeline ahead, and we're we're really excited about the capabilities that Gen AI will bring to our platform across the enterprise. And that's where we're seeing a lot of customer demand right now. Gina, a lot of the focus here as of late has been the macro headwinds that certainly are facing the broader economy. When we see this massive run up in rates, obviously having an impact on corporations, how do you see this affecting, do you see this affecting your spending investment plans at all for 2024? Yeah, so we've been really, I, I think, quite prudent in how we've been focused on spending. Um, we absolutely are hiring. We have continued to hire despite the macro headwinds because of the growth opportunity we see in front of us. But we've been really smart about our investments, um, really focused on R&D spend, net new in innovation, right? We absolutely believe at ServiceNow that the only way forward is net new innovation. Innovation equals growth. And really, if you're focused on driving that with our, our Gen AI SKUs, as well as all of our other product portfolio, we're really focused on investing there. And we're seeing our customers doing the exact same thing. Yeah, I'm taking a look at shares up on the day here, and, and many of our viewers seeing this price action here on the screen as well, up by about 6.5%. Uh, I bring this up because this is a critical time where some of the tech companies that have been under pressure 
where if they had a repur uh, shared repurchase plan like ServiceNow did, they would probably be leaning into that heavily uh, given the price action that we've seen interim. Do, do you expect that the company is going to be assessing where there are opportunities to even pull forward some of that spend in this, is what it, in this which is what it's uh, first of its kind, I think, for the company uh, shared repurchase plan that you talked about on the call a little bit? Yeah, so we were really excited to announce our first ever share repurchase program. Um, and we're really focused on offsetting dilution for our shareholders first and foremost. And so if you think about the success that we've had this quarter in our results, as well as the buybacks that we instituted, we are really driving an unparalleled match, uh, strong revenue growth, bottom line profitability, as well as shareholder value for all of our investors. All right, Gina, great to speak with you here on the day. Always a pleasure to get uh, some of the top brass's time from ServiceNow. Gina Massimitano, who is the ServiceNow Chief Financial Officer. Great to hear you on the call yesterday and good to speak with you this morning. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Brad. Thanks, Shauna, as well. Have a great day. Talk soon. All your markets action ahead, live from the NASDAQ market side. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. From a hot surge summer to a fall fumble, stocks have been feeling the pain so far this season, and October has been no different. But one sector in the S&P 500 has managed to eke out some gains this month. It's utilities. Sexy. Joining us now to shine some little light on this and this bright spot, our very own Jared Blickery. You know, it's not too often that utilities become interesting, but they are right now. That is that one lone green speck among the sea of red here, XLU. And let me just uh, chart the year-to-date price action here, basically from the upper left to the lower right. Now, what was happening during this time, uh, interest rates, yields were going higher. And for the most of this, uh, XLU, it's an interest rate sensitive sector, competes with bonds in terms of yield for investors' money. Um, we saw a lot of down pricing here. 
But only within the last couple of weeks, utilities have really become the outperformers, and that's what we're seeing now. Utilities uh, within the grand scheme of things on the year-to-date basis, guess what? They're still dead last. So it's only as of late that we've seen utilities kind of pick up the slack. Um, and if I'm looking at the top four sectors here, besides utilities, XLP, that's consumer staples, that's defensive. XLV, that's healthcare, that's arguably defensive. And then XLK, that's arguably defensive too, because that's dominant dominated by a lot of the mega cap names that have just been the reflexive go-to, uh, thinking back to Kathy Wood's cash stocks. Uh, I'm not supporting that mentality, but I think that's basically what was happening. Now, here is the 10-year T-note yield. I mentioned it's been on a tear going back six months from uh, 35 to 5%. That is 150 basis points. A huge, huge step for the bond market there. Uh, probably uh, we've seen this happen before, but not uh, within the last four decades. And back then, the price action was arguably a bit worse. Now, I want to dive inside the utility sector here and show you uh, some of the constituents. And here we go. This is still a month-to-date basis. Now, if I change this on a year-to-date, you can see the red. Again, most of the year, utilities have been under pressure because of the rise in yields. Uh, but now, over the last five days, you can see what a difference that has made. So I think at this stage in the equity cycle where utilities were not loved before, now we're seeing this resurgence where market participants are a little bit more skittish and they're liking those uh, defensive names like Staples and Healthcare as well. Guys. All right, Jared, thanks so much for the latest on that. Utilities, you're making it interesting. Oh, thank you. Like you said, it's kind of a tough job sometimes. Let's talk about one of the consumer-facing names, and that is Whirlpool. They just reported their quarter results this week. It beat the street's expectations for revenue and earnings, but the appliance maker did trim its full-year guidance, and that may have been enough here to spook some investors. Joining us now for more on the quarter, we're looking at losses just about 12% today. We want to bring in Mark Bitzer. He is the CEO of Whirlpool. We also have Brian Sazi, our executive editor, joining the conversation. Well, Mark, it's great to have you here. Let's talk about some of the trends that you're seeing from the consumer, right? We are seeing a lot of pressure on shares today, a lot of that being attributed to the revision that you made for your full year guidance. But what is the, cons I guess, what is your assessment on the health of the consumer right now? Yeah, Shona, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, you know, obviously we reported today uh, Q3 results, which year over year we, um, we posted one point of EBIT margin expansion. We had revenue growth. And we picked up market share. Um, yet at the same time, as you indicated, we trimmed our full year EBIT guidance um, to basically reflect the current market environment, which leads me to your question um, about the, sent the broader consumer sentiment. What we see on one hand is actually a very strong consumer sector. That's for replacement demand, consumers replacing just a, a, a failed or broken down appliance. What is soft is the discretionary side. And that is ultimately, and we know that, our business is strongly influenced by consumer confidence, uh, mortgage rates, and housing. And there's not a lot of momentum coming out of these three elements right now. So the discretionary side is soft, and that hurts us on the mix, and that hurts us overall in the volume in the business. Mark, Brian here, always great to get some time with you. And look, I, I give you high marks. You and your CFO, Jim Peters, very transparent on that earnings call uh, this morning. Talk to us about the promotional environment, given what you just said on, on demand and interest rates, do you have to pick up more promotions to move the units that you need to move? Yeah, Brian, I mean, we talk quite a bit about the promotion environment. And basically, the way I would simply characterize it, it's we're basically back to a pre-COVID, what I call normalized promotion environment. So in terms of the depth and also duration of certain, certain promotions, we're essentially fully back to pre-COVID. Um, to be transparent, we expected this to occur maybe one or two quarters later. Um, it now happened already in Q3, but we don't see it going beyond this one. And we actually see right now a stabilization of that promotion environment. Um, the reason why it probably came a little bit earlier is, coming back to my earlier point, the discretionary side of consumer demand has been soft and everybody's chasing the same consumer. And that's what we see reflected in the marketplace. Um, but we know how to operate in that by, by, by environment. That was pre-COVID and we did very well. And we also, even in this quarter, we expanded share and margin and we continue to intend to do that. What are you hearing from your partners on the housing front, Mark, where you've got these new homes that are being built out and they're giving Whirlpool a call or are already contracted to put a, a Whirlpool, uh, any of the inventory or any of the systems, of course. I, I love a great jacuzzi as much as the next person purchasing a new home. But what are you hearing from them as they're 
completing some of the homes that they have in backlog and even the new orders that are coming in that gives you kind of an insight into where the home buyer mindset is right now? Yeah, I mean, for probably lack of a better analogy, I would call right number housing market Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, <laughs> and the reason why I'm saying this on is, you know, you have two sides. The new housing, um, you all have seen the order intake is solid because there's just a stru structural demand, um, strong demand for new housing. Um, but keep in mind, any new order in housing, which we see on a builder side, that translates into an appliance sale only eight to 10 months down the road. It just, that's how long it takes to build the house. The other side is existing home sales, which is a very, very big part of our overall demand. And existing home sales, as you all seen it, are now sub 4 million. That's, you have to go back all the way back to 2010. So you have this odd situation where you have a structural undersupply of a market, which drives positive on new home. Um, but right now, there's just not exa enough existing homes on the inventory to turn around because everybody's afraid of losing attractive mortgage rates, et cetera. So that's, these are two very kind of opposing trends right now. Over time, in the long term, we state that repeatedly, um, we're very bullish on the mid and long term U.S. housing. Um, U.S. housing has been undersupplied by two or three million units. And at one point, the market will rebalance. Mark, I, th I think the stock today is trading off, in, in my view, what you said on in terms of just promotion, the promotional environment, and some softness and discretionary purchases and the outlook. But do you think the market doesn't understand what you're about to do with your European business? How does that changing of the operations impact your financials in 2024? Yeah, Brian, and of course, <laughs> There's many ways to read a market reaction, but I think one thing, element about the European transaction, I think as long as it's not actually closed, the market to some extent, extent will discount that. Fundamentally, closing that European transaction is a positive catalyst for our cash flow and our company performance. It will lift the overall EBIT margin, and as we indicated, it will improve the cash flow on an annual basis by about two two hundred fifty million dollars. So it's a significant positive. Um, but I'm not surprised that the market discounts it to some extent until we have actual closure of a transaction. Now, we feel very encouraged by the news which we got from the European Union, um, which cleared it unconditionally. Um, but the CMA in the UK is still a hold up. Um, but we expect to have that resolved um, by April next year. Mark, what are you seeing just from a cost perspective, how you see that potentially impacting volumes? And then I guess when it comes to the supply side of it, that obviously was a huge issue for you, many of your rivals going back to the start of the pandemic. Has that essentially stabilized at this point? Yeah, so the supply side is actually reasonably stable. There's still a little bit some tail end on some electronics and some smaller items, but we're basically back to the full availability, which we had before. On the cost side, and we alluded to this one early in our conference call, we actually throughout the year, we see every quarter a stronger cost position. Um, now, to put that in context, we have not fully recovered what co what the inflation cost us in the prior years. Um, but we, you know, Q3, we took up 300 million of cost. Um, and that is sizable. And Q4, we see even more. So we see good momentum on the cost side. And we do see some of that also carrying over into next year, um, fueled by own cost takeout actions, but also by raw material environment, um, which is more favorable than it was for last year. Mark, uh, lastly, I, I enjoyed how your earnings call started today. It was a video of a new insincorator uh, device or, or, or tool, I, not appliance, I should say, and, and was talking about how it can disintegrate chicken bones. I don't own a home, but I think I want one of those. Talk to us about the innovation pipeline for next year. If I do have some extra dollars to where I'm going to buy an appliance and put it on my credit card, even at a higher interest rate. What are some of the innovations from Whirlpool now that we have moved past the pandemic and consumers are back out there being more mobile? Yeah, so, so Brian, we need a lot more time on these calls <laughs> to explain <laughs> all the innovation. <laughs> but, you know, it depends, you know, it's, for example, if you start with washers, um, you know, our pet washer program is is a huge success in the marketplace. And if you have a dog or a, another pet at home, um, you will see its benefit. The two-in-one agitated on washing side. But even on the kitchen, what we do in induction or now what we introduce as a flush microwave food combination, these are some really, really strong innovation. And we do see the success of that in the marketplace. As a side note, Brian, and you know, it's it was also in our current earnings call this morning. We did invest more in marketing technology throughout this year, and we will continue to do so because we have a strong pipeline, we have great engineers with great ideas, um, and we will continue to launch wonderful and innovative products into next year. 
I just need to make sure that I can safely dishwash some wine glasses, Mark, and it sounds like you guys have some good <laughs> solutions for that here. I know Brian Saz is a big fan of the wine. I'm excited well about the here. pet washer. Right, I don't so know what that is, but I got to check out whirlpool.com. I don't know what a pet washer is, but it sounds fun to me. I don't even have a dog or cat. Mark, I got... I, di I didn't call yeah, it the look, pet got... washer. You, you <laughs> so don't put your pet in the washer, <laughs> but it removes pet hair wonderful. Okay. All right, that is, that is uh, good news to the ears of, of the cat monkey who is at, Very at my home right clarify. now. Um, so <laughs> good clarification. Mark, appreciate the time. Mark Blitzer, who is, Mark Bitzer, who is the CEO of Whirlpool. Thanks for taking the time here today. Thank, thanks for having me. Absolutely. All your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay with us. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Mattel out with better than expected results, but the stock under some pressure here uh, on concerns about the company's holiday season outlook. Let's get right to Mattel chairman and CEO, Anand Cries. Anand, always great to get some time with you on, on earnings uh, morning after. So I'm guessing this, was, this quarter was all about Barbie, right? Yes, hi, Brian. Great, great to see you. Uh, it was a great quarter for Mattel. Our results exceeded expectations. We saw consumer demand for our product increasing and we continue to outpace the industry. It was also a breakout quarter for the company with the, on our entertainment strategy, benefiting from the incredible success of the Barbie movie. But it wasn't just about Barbie. Uh, Hot Wheels performed very well, and we saw continued increase in consumer demand, not just for the quarter, but also year to date. We expect to see consumer demand increasing in the holiday season, in the fourth quarter, and the full year. So all in all, we're very well positioned competitively. 
and feel good about where we're heading into the fourth quarter and expect to see significant margin expansion uh, and, and achieve our guidance, which we just raised uh, following the strong quarter. And now within the Barbie category, just given how popular the movie is and, and was when it came out, what are people buying within that franchise? Is it just concentrated in dolls or are there some other moving pieces here? Well, Barbie is an incredible franchise, part of our uh, very strong dolls category, but uh, it is as, as successful as Barbie movie is, the Barbie franchise continues to grow. The movie clearly will strengthen and broaden the audience for Barbie, and we expect Barbie to grow for the year. With the success of the movie, continue to, to, to uh, push the brand forward uh, in years to come. This is not just about the quarter or for the year. And in addition to that, we also saw growth with Disney Princess and Frozen in the quarter. Monster High is performing very well. So the dolls category as a whole uh, is really thriving. The vehicles category as well, led by Hot Wheels, which grew 19% in the quarter, is also performing very strongly. And we expect that to grow as well for the year. So what we are seeing heading into the fourth quarter is a broad-based offering with innovative products across price point, play patterns, and we expect to see more support from retailers with more shelf space, more advertising, more representation across uh, catalogs, uh, holiday catalogs, and all in all, very well positioned to continue to incre uh, increase share in the quarter and achieve our guidance. I'm not going to ask you 2024 guidance and on because I know you're not going to give it to me on, on live global TV, but I will ask you this. What is next for Barbie? I imagine your teams for months have been uh, designing and thinking about what else is for this brand, what else could be coming down the pike for 2024? What is coming down the pike for Barbie next year? Well, Barbie is a very large canvas and we continue to innovate and find more ways to expand the brand. It's not just about the Barbie, it's about the entire universe around Barbie. And the opportunity for us is to continue to extend that across uh, toy lines, content, uh, including uh, not just film, but also television, attractions, um, uh, live events, consumer product, digital experiences, and other verticals that in some cases are, are actually bigger than the toy industry, all driven by big franchises. And this is what we bring to the table. It's not just Barbie. It's all of our other portfolio, the other brands in an incredible portfolio which represents some of the strongest brands and franchises across uh, uh, children and family in the world. I've been talking to a lot of leaders this week, uh, Anand, and, and the vibe seems to be this was really the first quarter where higher interest rates started to impact uh, businesses uh, on a global scale. Are you seeing that in your business? Because there was, I think, some level of caution with respect to the outlook. Yes, we see uh, the industry is softening. Uh, we expect the industry to be flat entering the year, and we're now saying that it will be down mid single digit. But bear in mind, this is after the industry grew 22% from 2019 to 2022, reaching an all time high. So the fundamentals of the toy industry are very strong. The industry plays to a fundamental human behavior of play, it's a strategic category for retailers. Parents will always continue to spend more money on their children, especially when it comes to quality product and trusted brands. The items are affordable, and it, it's a strategic category for, for all the major retailers. So we feel very good about the toy industry's long-term growth prospects, notwithstanding this year that is impacting by, by a softer economy. And within that environment, even in this year, we expect to continue to, uh, to outpace the market and gain share. Uh, we gained 60 basis points market share so far in the year, and we expect to continue to outpace the industry and, and, um, and gain more share. And as I said, we, this, is a, this quarter uh, was a strong one. In spite of the environment, we continue to uh, grow, we continue to expand our margin, and we expect yet another uh, further expansion of margin in the fourth quarter and achieve higher profitability than, than we expected entering the year. Uh, now, before um, we let you go, I, um, look, I, you grew up in, in Israel, um, and I've talked to you for some time. 
to the extent you can or want to talk about this, what has this been, you know, the past two weeks been like for you personally? Thank you for asking. Um, as an Israeli, uh, uh, this is very personal. And I know too many people who lost loved ones or have uh, relatives that have been kidnapped and are held currently uh, hostage in Gaza. Um, but on behalf of Mattel, we condemn the terrorism and atrocities uh, perpetrated by Hamas and stand against hate and violence in all forms. And we truly express our hope for the uh, safety of Israeli and Palestinian children and families caught in the Israeli-Hamas war. Since the attacks on October 7th, the Mattel Children, Children Foundation has been focused on humanitarian work, including cash and toy donations to shelters and hospitals to support children who are suffering. And we really wish for a swift uh, resolution for this war, uh, to this war and, and, and more peaceful times in the future. Uh, we, we greatly appreciate that perspective, Anand. Uh, I had to ask you, so I, I, I really appreciate that. We'll leave it there. Uh, Mattel Chairman, and CEO Anand Karaz, good to see what you're doing there uh, on those efforts, and we'll talk to you soon. Good luck this holiday season. Thank you, Warren. All right, and we'll be right back after this break.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance on this very busy morning for all things tech. Who better to talk tech than former Cisco CEO and current leader of JC2 Ventures? That is John Chambers. John, it's been a while. Thanks for back. coming back to Yahoo Finance. I come back every year I appreciate and I'll always be there for you. Well, I appreciate that. So look, I think a lot of folks on Yahoo Finance are trying to figure out, uh, did we just get the best it's going to get within some of the big cap tech names. Some of these stocks are selling off. I mean, how do you see it? What's coming down the pike for these names? Well, in the long term, I think you're just at the front end of a huge uh, emergence of next generation technology. It will be around AI. So for your viewers, think of mainframes, mini computers, the PC, the internet, the cloud, now AI. Those companies who get AI right are going to have explosive growth, both for your big companies, like you saw from Microsoft, Service now reporting today, et cetera, on it. And if you don't, you get left behind. Now, is there going to be a consolidation? Absolutely. And if you look at the indicators, uh, let's use startups as an example. There were a huge number of unicorns and decacorns created uh, in 2021. Those numbers are now just 10% for unicorns and 15% for decacorns. So you're seeing investments in terms of the careful selection start to change. Uh, overall, this will be the decade of AI, and it will transform every company, every individual, et cetera. And it shouldn't be feared. We just got to say, how do we operate within it? But if you're investing in companies that not only don't have a good AI strategy, or as Bill McDermott said, are executing the AI strategy, you're probably going to be disappointed. Well, then, are you just surprised to see these stocks sell off? Or is it just that, or how quarterly? I mean, you used to get up there. No matter what Cisco reported, yeah. you got up there on TV and talked about it. I mean, are these sell-offs just overdone, just given what you're talking about? No, I don't think so. I, I, I think people are still sorting out the winners and losers. Brian, as you know, historically, no large leader in one area, like mainframes, ever was the leader in many computers. No large uh, leader in PC and servers was the leader in the internet. Historically, people have not made that transition well. However, maybe for the first time, you're seeing a Microsoft make that transition. Uh, Meta's numbers were pretty good, up 23% on it. But it does speak to normally the startups, and I'm a huge startup backer. I've got uh, nine unicorns out of 20 companies. and none 20 of companies them, now? Yeah, and none of them have a, had a down round yet. In fact, my AI players that I bet on seven years ago, like a Unifor, are up almost 100x since I invested 2.5 billion, and we think we're just getting started. So I think for your listeners, you've got to pick out who are going to be the winners and losers. Not just can they talk AI. Talking AI was the right thing six months ago. Today, you better be producing the results. Do you see a consolidation wave? Uh, Microsoft, all that cash, Alphabet, all that cash. Do you think they'll acquire some of these, these unicorns and decacorns out there? I absolutely think they will, but I think we've got to be careful here. You don't want companies to be too big and too powerful because sometimes they misuse it. So I think we've got to be very careful. Innovation comes from the startups. That's where our innovation has always occurred. So we've got to make sure they have a fair footing in terms of growth. But am, are my companies partnering with these big companies? Absolutely. Partnering with the Microsoft, partnering uh, with an AMD, partnering uh, with the ServiceNow, et cetera. And that's what I think the industry's like. But for your other viewers, uh, the non-tech companies, and by the way, every company will become first a technology company. You and I have talked about that for a decade. Now I'd argue this is the digital age going to the logarithmic age. Every company will become an AI. So you're going to see these large companies partnering with startups, often partnering rather than acquiring because they want the startups to continue to maintain the momentum. As someone that managed and led a very large organization through the mm -hmm. dot-com bubble. What yep. is your advice right now to this next generation of tech leaders, these AI companies that are kind of operating in a similar environment, not, not totally the same, but something similar? So the question you're asking me, uh, are we in a bubble? The answer is yes. Uh, however, those companies that emerge out of this bubble will emerge in great shape. The average unicorn uh, valuation is down in the secondary market versus their last round, and I'm just now understanding that market by over 50% in terms of what they trade in the secondary market. So that's a nice way of saying many of the unicorns will never be unicorns again. Same thing with some of them. They got a little bit ahead on the hype. Uh, however, as this industry consolidates and the winners become more obvious, just like the winners in prior generation of the cloud, which you ended up being Microsoft and Oracle and Google, uh, et cetera, on it, you're going to see the same type of uh, uh, emergence on the AI group. So in total, would it be a great field to be in? Yes. Is the breakage going to be dramatic? Yes. And what's different is the speed of change. If you look at your numbers, just for your audience, uh, we've had the tightest 
uh, correcting ever in terms of tightening uh, uh, in the market uh, uh, that is 1,500% per year. Uh, that is seven times the fastest that's ever occurred before. And we had the highest stimulus, five times faster in 2008 for a year and a half with five trillion in stimulus. That's a nice way of saying with all these variables you and I are talking about, combine the geopolitical issues, odds on a soft landing are going down. Uh, there's only really been one soft landing in the last 60 years, but I'm, I'm a pilot by background. If I land that plane, it bounces a couple of times on the tarmac, I'm okay. <laughs> That's what I hope we get here. I still have yet to find in my career doing this, someone yeah. that is, I think, tr in the leadership role, traveled as much as you have, talked to as many world leaders as you have. This is a very uncertain time to be the CEO of a company, given what we're seeing in the Middle East, Ukraine and Russia. How should a leader be leading it at this particular moment? Well, I think th that you, know, you and I have talked about the trends for the last four years. Uh, we were the first ones, I think, on your show, actually predicting that this virus coming out of Southeast Asia is going to have major economic impact in March of 2020. turned out to be very good. In 2022, you and I talked, and we talked about COVID would no longer be the key issue, it will be inflation. And now we're talking about agility being the key, key issue. I think agility is the key here. Secondly, for your investors and others, cash is about to be king in a big way. There's going to be a liquidity crunch for big companies, smaller companies, the consumer. Consumer savings are down dramatically versus pre-COVID areas and down almost 20 percent from the second year within the COVID group. So as you think about this, you've got to say, how do you play in that environment? You're right. I'm headed off to India to, uh, uh, Friday night. Uh, I'll be meeting with all the government leaders Still in India. It. Oh, I love it. And if you're going to bet on one economy, bet on India. If you're going to bet on two, bet on India twice. Modi has a 78 percent approval rating. We don't have a leader here in this country. It's over 50. And his economic plans for his country are amazing. U.S. and India, tight alignment in terms of the direction. But I would think this world of uncertainty is here to stay. I've never seen as many variables at one time. I know the Middle East very well. I'm very close to Israel and our hearts and soul go out to the horrific issues that occurred there. Uh, but I'm also very close across the rest of the Middle East. And that's where a lot of the capital is coming in. Can be benefiting America as well and startups. Is it important for a CEO to speak out at a moment like this? I think when CEOs, this is my view, when CEOs speak out, they don't need to speak out on every single topic. I think implying that we're an expert in each category is wrong. When you know a topic well or you have investments like I'd, I have done for 30 years in Israel. Shimon Perez was a great friend. He's passing four years ago, maybe one of the best leaders I've ever seen. You have to speak out in that area, and, and it's unacceptable for what the terrorists did in that area. But you've also got to speak out, we have to bring peace. And Shimon was also the person that taught me you never get peace without a middle class and a startup community. So I like what I see occurring in the rest of the Middle East in terms of across uh, areas such as Saudi Arabia and uh, Kuwait and Qatar, that they're beginning to develop more of a middle class, encourage an investments, transition their economy, more inclusion. Still a long way to go. So I think it is to speak out where you have expertise. Where you don't have expertise and speak out on every topic, I, I personally think that leaves the CEO exposed. John, What Chamber do you think? I, I, I like that I'm actually seeing more CEOs speak out, John. I, mean, I, I think this, was not, this would not have been the case four, five, or uh, six years ago. Yeah. But it's good to get their views on certain things. Before you came on, we just had Mattel CEO Anand Kreis on. He, yeah. was li he has lived in Israel. Yes. So to hear him speak out and hear about how he's donating and yeah. helping that cause, I think is very important. Well, you know, using Israel as an example, it's a startup nation for a reason. They will be resilient. And I, I literally uh, led the peace mission after the Hezbollah-Israeli uh, conflict of, you know, over a decade ago uh, into Lebanon uh, for President Bush and seeing what would be the recommendation on it out. Israel is very resilient. They will come through this. It's traumatic and it's probably going to last longer than you think. I think it's important for us to be there. And President Biden, I think commitment was an important message to send. John Chambers, always great to get some time with you. Uh, really, it's always uh, really a treat. JC2 Ventures leader, former longtime Cisco CEO. Safe travels to India. Good to see you. Good. Look forward to seeing you on the next trip. Absolutely. We'll talk Thank to you, you soon. Thank you, my friend. Guys, back to you. Uh, actually, we're going off to break. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. Mercedes-Benz shares are lower this morning, seeing profit decline in the third quarter as supply chain pressures and price cuts in the EV space took a toll. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Pras Subramanian to give us more insight into what's happening in the EV market, and especially on that luxury end here, Pras. I know, Brad, you and I both have seen that EQS AMG. We both thought it was we a have. pretty cool or pretty nice looking car, but there might be sort of a reckoning here in the EV market, at least with Mercedes, they reported a profit decline and revenue drop due to challenges from the EV from EV competition and also supply chain issues. Uh, Mercedes EBIT fell around 7% to 5.06 billion, uh, revenue down 1.4% to 39 billion, both below analyst estimates. I'm um, looking at EVs, Mercedes says it faced a subdued market environment marked by intense price competition. Also, C CFO Harold Wilhelm said that the EV market was pretty, was a quote, unquote, pretty brutal space, uh, adding that I can hardly imagine the current status quo is fully sustainable for everybody. So not great there. However, Mercedes said it's still targeting a 50% hybrid and EV global sales uh, sort of mix by 2025. And it says it'll only launch EV only cars after that in 2025. And, and you know, you know, prior to this, uh, Mercedes is doing pretty well. They were selling their high end, top end price vehicles, were getting good margins there, good selling there. Uh, and they were and using those those gains to subsidize the EV transition. It seems that transition is sort of slowing down and as sort of as buyers balk at high prices. And at least here in the US, you also have the infrastructure problem. There's not many charges out there for people to use. Yeah, Pras, I guess my question is, how much do you think that this is going to delay kind of the EV adoption? And we're not just talking about Mercedes. You talked about the fact that we're seeing it from other big industry players. We know Ford, GM has scaled back maybe some of their plans to ramp up EV production. So what does that do just in terms of targets and that eventual mass adoption that we've all been waiting for? Everyone's been waiting for that sub forty thousand dollar EV, which is yeah. maybe the holy grail, maybe even thirty thousand dollar EV. That's going to be the one that that's there for mass adoption. But I think the problem is twofold. You have prices that are too high right now, and the cars cost too much money to make, so the manufacturers aren't really making an, a, a, a profit or any profit at all. Plus, like I mentioned, the charging infrastructure is so uh, poor, at least some parts of the country, it's it's hard to make justify that cost. You know, we saw, of course, in our Yahoo Finance Ipsos poll that. Uh, nearly 60% of people are not interested in an EV at this time. It's even more so worse for trucks, things like SUVs and EVs. So I think there's sort of a, like I said, a reckoning here in this country where people need to see a value proposition, but also the infrastructure build out here. And it's almost a chicken and egg thing. So you're not going to pay a lot of money to get the car unless you see the EV infrastructure, but you're not going to see the EV infrastructure unless you actually have the cars on the road. Pros, this is really interesting to continue to track. I, I mean, I'm loading up, uh, I don't know, Carvana <laughs> right now just to see what prices are going at. And, and I'm keying in some of these Mercedes vehicles just to see uh, where people might be perhaps taking on some price um, for the former combustion engine versions. But that EQE that we sat in, it was the EQE, EQE was it? Uh, EQS AMG. It was, it was the yes. piece, right? The whole screen and the panel. We I mean, are living large. Dash. It's the AMG. It was gorgeous. You guys got to take me with you next time. I want to be sitting yes. in these luxury. It's got touch screen in the back. In the back. In the back. Wow. Incredible. All right. We're, we're definitely Pras, doing we're that. Definitely go. doing that. <laughs> we got to do that. All right, Pras. Thanks so much for breaking that down for us. Let's take a look at where things stand. Just about 90 minutes into the trading day, and we're still looking at a mixed picture here. We have the Dow trading to the upside, just above the fly line, up about a tenth of a percent. You have the S&P and the Nasdaq, though. Still under pressure. The Nasdaq off just about six tenths of a percent. When you take into account the fact that the Nasdaq fell into correction territory yesterday, more pressure following uh, earnings results that we've seen this week. Meta, one of the dec decliners of the day here, not enough for what the street was looking for. And then you look ahead to some of the results that we will be getting after the bell this afternoon. We'll hear from Intel. We'll hear from Amazon. You're getting it, giving us a better picture just on the cloud market, also the consumer, and also just where chip makers stand, at least at this point. Also another, uh, we got some key econ data points out before the bell this morning. Jobless claims and GDP, U.S. economy growing at 4.9% last quarter. That's the fastest pace that we've seen in just about two years. Yeah, real estate leading the pack and communication services bringing up the caboose. All right, everyone, that does it for us here on this day. For Brad Smith, Shauna Smith, and the entire crew, well, stick around. They've got much more Yahoo Finance Live coming your way, 11 a.m.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo. Here's a look at what I'm watching this morning. A new era for Morgan Stanley. Ted Pick, a three-decade veteran of the firm, has been named CEO. Now, Pick is already credited with revamping the firm's trading business after a downturn in 2008. What will the 54-year-old's tenure bring to Wall Street? And social media stocks are under pressure. Investors fear growing tensions in the Middle East could weigh on advertising dollars. Both Meta and Snapchat saw better than expected revenue in the latest quarter, but could the trend reverse course? Plus, the U.S. economy grew even faster than expected in the third quarter, buoyed by a strong consumer in spite of high interest rates. What does this mean for the next week's interest rate decision from the Fed? And the long-term prospects for the inflation fight as well. But first, let's give you a quick check of the markets at the moment. Looking at a mixed picture here, as we're just 90 minutes into the trading day, we're looking at big tech leading the pack down. The Dow currently up ever so slightly, about 30 points, relatively flat, about a tenth of a percent. The S&P 500 there also down about a third of a percent. Tech heavy Nasdaq there seeing the biggest losses so far, down 90 points or about 0.7 percent. Let's also check in on the Treasury market as well. We've seen something of a retreat um, in yield so far this morning. We see the five year down about 1.6 percent. The 10 year still near that 5 percent mark, but still at the moment down about 1 percent on the day. And the 30 year also down about 0.7 percent. Well, it's a busy week for corporate earnings. Kenview, the former consumer health operations of Johnson & Johnson, saw third quarter net sales and organic growth increase. Meanwhile, a slow start to the, co- to the cold cough and flu season, contributing to a tightening in the company's 2023 outlook. Joining us now to discuss this and more is Kenview CEO Thibaut Mongon, alongside Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kemlani. Big welcome to you both. Um, so first, I want to start on what we've seen with earnings, especially as we factor in some of the things that we've been seeing with cold and flu season and how you're seeing that affecting the bottom line from here on out, Thibault. Yes, good morning, Rachel. Good morning, Anjali. Good to see you again. Uh, yeah, we had a, a healthy quarter in Q3 with $3.9 billion in, in revenue, uh, 3.6% growth on top of 4.7% growth last year. Uh, that shows the power of the portfolio we have at, uh, at Kenview and the strength of our model. We uh, announced another 20 cent dividend per share payable in November. So pleased with our results and confident in our future. And to your point about, about the future, we have maintained the base of our guidance for the full year, but tightened it to reflect a soft uh, start of the cold and flu uh, season. But we see once again here as the power of the Kenview portfolio with even if we see some softness uh, potential in the, uh, in the cold and flu season, we see other parts of the portfolio uh, doing very well, like uh, uh, smoking cessation or allergy uh, or digestive health uh, and other parts of our, of our portfolio. So we are confident in our future. We continue to innovate uh, for consumers uh, around the world. Winter is coming, as we just talked about. It's important for cold and flu, but it's also important in skin care with moisturizers being a big part of the winter regimen. We are launching a new Neutrogena gel cream that gives you nine times more hydration. So confident in uh, the coming quarter and the future of Kenview. Hey, well, Anjali here. Really good to see you again. I know that part of the story for the company is, uh, you know, basically recovery. There's a lot to go into operating solo. And you did mention, of course, the headwinds and the strong dollar. So can you tie that together and talk to us about what we really should be looking for in the Kenview story for 2024? Yeah, we continue to build up our, our company as a fit-for-purpose, standalone company focused on the consumer, and we are on track with uh, with, with a program uh, moving into, into the future. We continue to focus on what we have done for 135 years and do best, which is being close to consumers, making sure that we bring to them the product, the solutions that they need to take care of their own health. Um, and, and the health of their, their loved ones. And we do it across the portfolios. So what we can expect for 24 is continued consumer intimacy, continued innovation. I talked about innovation in skincare. In self-care, we just launched a, a new product called Motrin Dual Action that puts together ingredients from two iconic brands, Motrin and Tylenol. And it has been very well received by, by consumers in, in the US. So these are just two examples of the vibrancy of the, of the portfolio we, we have. 
and we continue to be very close to, to consumers today and in the future. And Thibault, we know, of course, right now, a lot of consumers are very price conscious at the moment. Are there certain demographics that you're going to be targeting, either domestically here in the US or internationally? Yeah, we see, we see that the consumers are, are more choiceful, but frankly, they've always been choiceful. And when you are talking about your health or the health of your loved ones, what we see consumers doing is continue to reach out to brands they trust that are backed by science, recommended by healthcare professionals, and when you look at the Kenju portfolio, it's really what Kenju is all about. Tylenol, Bande, Neutrogena, Listerine, uh, Motrin, and so many other brands that have been in people's homes for years, decades, generations sometimes. That's what, uh, cons that's what the brands that consumers reach out to. And that's why we see that our pr private label penetration in our categories is, uh, is stable. Uh, slightly down, actually, in, uh, in, in the recent past, uh, because consumers go for trusted brands. And that's what we offer at Kenview. Well, I know that you mentioned uh, on the call that you know the uh, cold and flu revenue is really about 2% of the total uh, company sales. And I know that there's also other small areas where Kenview does play, including, of course, the big story about weight loss uh, drugs and the anti-nausea medication. You do have one product in that category. Have you noticed any movement at all when it comes to sales there, or is it too small to track? Yeah, we, we see a uh, strong demand in our digestive health segment. Uh, we have a strong brand called Imodium that is uh, doing very well. And we see increased demand for, for this, uh, this brand uh, in the US and around the world. Um, and that's what the power of the Kenview uh, portfolio. We have very strong uh, positions in a number of different categories. And that's what allows us to deliver sustained performance over time. So the focus for us is to be here when consumers need us with the products that they need, always backed by science, recommended by healthcare professionals. And Thibault, I do have to ask about some news that crossed this morning uh, regarding the class action lawsuit surrounding the efficacy of phenylephrine and, and whether or not some of the risks, the alleged risks that weren't fully disclosed during the IPO process. How do you see that affecting investors here? What message would you give them about some of this news that's coming out? Yeah, we don't see any impact to the business uh, to date. Uh, what uh, we know is that uh, health authorities around the world review ingredients on a routine basis. Uh, in this particular case, it's important to note that the FDA has not made any determination. There is a clear process that they are going through. And we'll continue to work with the agency and with customers to make sure that consumers uh, continue to have access to the products they need when they need them. We well, appreciate you taking the time to join us and uh, congratulations on a bumper earnings season as well. Thibaut Mongon, Kenview Chief Executive Officer and our very own Anjali Kemlani. A big thank you to you both. Thank you. Well, long-time Morgan Stanley insider Ted Pick will succeed James Gorman as CEO on January 1st, ending a widely watched succession race inside one of the biggest firms on Wall Street. So how will Ted Pick help one of Wall Street's most prestigious banks continue to thrive? Let's bring in Chris Whalen, chairman at Whalen Global Advisors, to discuss. Good to see you, Chris. So talk about this Good succession morning. here and what this means, especially at this point in time, when we're obviously coming at a point of high interest rates and in the thick of earnings season as well. Well, obviously, the, the tenure of Mr. Gorman was successful. He picked up the pieces after 2008, and he pivoted and turned Morgan Stanley into an asset manager. So today they are a direct peer of UBS, which is clearly the winner in Europe. And I think among what I call the asset gatherers in the U.S., Morgan Stanley is by far and away uh, the best positioned firm. Now, having said that, they are still going to have to work the stock price down a little bit because they're still way overvalued after 2020, 21, when all of the big sell side firms uh, saw a huge lift in their stock prices because of the volumes in the market. We don't have that today. So I think Morgan Stanley's in good shape. Uh, good choice in Mr. Pick. They've kept the other contenders happy for now, which is very significant. And I think it shows you the culture of the firm. They are doing an orderly transition, and it speaks very well. 
And Chris, when you think about where uh, Morgan Stanley is right now, especially you looking at revenue from investment, banking and trading falling That's in awesome. Q3, what is he inheriting here? And what are, what are investors going to need from him from this point? Well, what he's inheriting is a, a nice, uh, stable three-legged stool. If you compare them to Citi or Goldman Sachs, they're clearly better positioned because when capital markets and the uh, really the transactional side of the business slows down, you have the big asset management portfolio. That was the plan, I think, that Gorman had all along. And remember, people were critical of him for spending the money to buy the other firms that have given them this position. Now, those decisions look pretty, pretty solid because there's nothing left to buy. There's nothing for a Goldman or a city to buy to complete their business. So I think overall, this is a good uh, time for Gorman to be picking a successor. But let's face it, the business is going to be hard for the next couple of years. And shareholders are going to have to figure out, do they want to stick with the stock or do they want to back off for a while until there's more of a, a driver, more of a catalyst on the capital market side? Because it's going to be quiet this year. It's going to be quiet next year. And when you think of the turnaround story, uh, Pick's contributions to turning Morgan Stanley around when it was yes. having, you know, obviously serious problems back in 2008 and the financial crisis. How do you think that experience positions him now when we are in very uncertain times when it comes to the banking industry? Well, they're only partly a bank. Let's remember the big business unit at Morgan Stanley is the broker dealer. They do have a big bank dock. They've got half a trillion dollars in core deposits, which is great. So when you look at those two pieces, it gives them strength. It allows them to fund themselves, albeit on an arm's length basis. And I think that gives them a lot of tools and a lot of ability to manage the change you're referring to uh, without having to go hat in hand to the street. So if you compare them to Goldman, where funding costs is probably the single biggest vulnerability of that firm, then I think it's, it's night and day. Let's also remember that Basel is coming. Let's also remember that we're going to see centralized clearing for treasuries coming up very soon. This is going to tend to de-risk the street. You're going to see less uh, leverage in terms of derivatives and other activities, which have been important to Morgan Stanley. So now they're going to have to, you know, they're going to have to make a change. And they're going to have to emphasize different parts of the business, which are growing like asset management. And over time, you know, the, the deal flow will come back. But this year so far, you, as you know very well, looking at IPOs, this has not been a, a, a tremendous year so far. And how would you describe Pick's leadership style versus Gorman, especially when you think of some of the big personalities, your Jamie Diamonds, your, your, your Solomons? Where does he rank in that? I don't really know. I don't know him personally. Um, the fact that he has a low profile is because he's a banker. Bankers are, are best seen and not heard. I don't expect him to compete with Jamie Dimon as a public personality because, you know, that's evolved over decades. Uh, Jamie's good at it. He's got a great command of his business, so he's able to uh, speak extemporaneously during earnings calls. I expect Pick to be quieter, and I think he's going to keep focused on the business, much like Gorman. I wouldn't see a whole lot of difference between the two styles because the culture at Morgan Stanley ultimately, I think, is what saved that firm. It was the people the quality of the people they have, and also still an old legacy of the old Morgan culture, which I think held them together while they built things like program trading, for example. So they're now able to compete head to head with Goldman if they want to. They were also very big in derivatives. In fact, they're bigger now uh, than Goldman in that regard. So I think over time, they're going to have to adjust these businesses in the new regulatory environment. And also, we may have interest rates where they are for a long time. That's a different market. Indeed, a different market indeed. Appreciate your insights, Chris Whalen, Whalen Global Advisors Chairman. Appreciate you joining me this Have morning. Have a great day. You too. All right, now for today's trending ticker. We're watching shares of MasterCard, the company forecasting weaker revenue growth in the months ahead on fears that consumer spending may be headed for a slowdown. In the third quarter, resilient shoppers helped MasterCard report a profit ahead of expectations. The stock currently down about 5.5% this morning. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Meta reporting record sales amid its year of efficiency, and its thread social media app, a top rival to Elon Musk's X, appears to be on the rise. CEO Mark Zuckerberg saying Threads has almost 100 million monthly active users, and he's optimistic the app could reach 1 billion in a few years. But how does it stack up against the current social media landscape? Here to discuss this and more is Carnegie Mellon University professor Ari Lightman. Ari, good to have you on the show here. So break this down for us, because we know there was a, a lot of fuss coming in when Threads first launched as, as a rival here to Twitter. What's the reality here in terms of how, how, how the sort of usage that we see globally versus the amount of fanfare that we really saw from Threads at the beginning? Yeah, well, initially when Threads came out, we saw it being one of the most downloaded apps um, in history, uh, according to sources. But um, what happened was people were a little confounded associated with utilization. How do I utilize this opposed to other microblogging platforms like Twitter, or X, um, Spill, Post, a variety of other ones that they might be utilizing. But now it's seen an upsur uh, upsurgence associated with both users and utilization. I think it might be due to some of the chaos that we see within the social media landscape around everything from misinformation to um, <clears throat> just features and functionalities available on the platform associated with use. And um, Facebook's been, uh, Meta has been fantastic about uh, providing some of those features, some of those functions that users want. Um, so we've seen uh, uptick associated with utilization, people sort of rediscovering the app in terms of its usage and value. And you raise an interesting point. I mean, it's it's a very crowded space here. We see YouTube, though, far and ahead, the biggest player here. But when you look at what we've been seeing with advertisers, what is the story there? Because we know there's some questions about whether or not people are going to want their ads next to some of this more political content, especially not just with the, the invasion right now between um, Israel and Hamas, but also with the election upcoming next year in the U.S. Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, um Listen, the digital advertising space is huge. It's a half trillion dollar industry. And part of that, a real big percentage of that is really looking at social advertising or hyper-targeted advertising. And, uh, you know, Meta as well as other social platforms utilizing advertising as a mainstay of the revenue base. And they have quite a bit of data that they utilize. So when you have the largest platform out there in terms of usage and in terms of users, that's where advertisers are gonna go and it seems to be one of the less chaotic ones in the space right now. You have concerns from uh, Twitter users or advertisers on X associated with Elon Musk's activities. You have uh, concerns around TikTok, even though it's highly utilized. There's concerns associated with bans around the platform. So as those things get sorted out, uh, Meta looks like a fairly safe bet for advertisers right now. And as you compare the ecosystem, especially, you know, you have you have mobile, you have Meta, which is obviously its, its own ecosystem. Where are you seeing the ad dollars primarily going here and how strategic are advertisers being right now on social media? I think they're they're of the mind that um, it provides tremendous value for them, but a little bit of concerns associated with the risks. Um, the idea of being able to target specific audiences is very incredibly valuable, and especially in this day and age where uh, information, uh, personal information, privacy information is uh, less likely to be available. Um, and so consequently, uh, Meta, which has this for a large extent, can provide some tremendous value to advertisers looking to reach target markets as well as looking at adjacent markets, so markets that might be have some affinity associated uh, with their products or with their service and to want to discover things. So when you look at analytics, um, they have a phenomenal analytics platform for advertisers to really discover, to understand the value they're getting associated with their advertising spend. And that's part of part of parcel of why they're winning sort of the war for advertiser revenue budgets. And when you think of the future, we know that X wants to become a, an everything app. Is that going to be the future of some of these social media companies? And is there a concern about cannibalizing some of their, some of their um, existing um, offerings as well as the ad dollars as well? 
Absolutely. I mean, everybody looks to what happened in China with WeChat, right? Which is the Uber app where you can do a variety of different functions, a variety of different features, and consequently just spending more time. And also, if you look at the revenue base, it's diversified across a variety of different features and platforms and those sorts of things. So that's what folks are going to go uh, move towards. If 90 percent or more of your of your revenue is predicated on advertising that's putting you know all your eggs in one basket so you're looking at diversified revenue streams associated with transactions and a variety of other things um meta has been somewhat successful in that to some extent if you look at facebook marketplaces and the like and those sorts of things look at their acquisition of whatsapp um so they're trying to diversify their revenue base um but some of the social platforms that are out there that are solely predicated on advertising might have a very difficult time if there is a downturn associated with the economy and, and a reduction associated with advertising spend. Indeed, and we'll be tracking all of that action. I appreciate you joining us this morning. Carnegie Mellon University Professor Ari Lightman, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, Amazon is next in line from the Magnificent Seven to report its quarterly results. This coming as some big tech players recently failed to live up to investors' expectations. Here to set the scene on what to watch from Amazon's earnings is Yahoo Finance's Ali Garfinkel. Ali, what are you keeping an eye on? Rochelle, it's been a fundamentally cautious week in tech earnings, though results have often come in really well. The guidance has been less than optimistic in many cases, and it's very possible that Amazon could be another chapter in that story. Now, there are two metrics you should be watching from Amazon today, AWS sales and operating margin. On the AWS side, it's sort of been a tale of two clouds this week, as our tech editor, Dan Howley, called it. And it's now going to be a tale of three clouds. So earlier this week, Microsoft came in with some very positive cloud growth, Google disappointed, and now Amazon is sitting here ready to break that tie one way or the other. AWS is also particularly in the crosshairs. Growth has been slowing. And it is a problem that has been getting a lot of airtime with investors. Now, on the operating margin side, Amazon's margins have been steadily going up throughout this year. They up, went up about 32 percent between Q1 and Q2, and they're estimated to come in today at more than 5 percent. That's up from Q1, which was 2.5 percent. So that's a substantial increase. And if you're wondering why you should be thinking about this metric, it's about efficiency. How successful have, have Amazon's efficiency pushes been? whether it's layoffs or their regionalization efforts in their warehouses. Ultimately, there is evidence to suggest that there actually is a correlation between Amazon's operating margins going up and the stock appreciating. That's according to Wedbush data. And that happens over time. So here today, right now, Amazon is navigating some pretty choppy waters, Rochelle. Indeed. We'll see how the Magnificent Seven that, that led the S&P 500 so far up this year, if what goes up must come down. We'll see if that continues. Thank you, as always, our very own Ali Garfinkel. Thanks so much. All right. All your markets action still ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Warren Buffett strikes again. The Oracle of Omaha is upping his bet on Occidental Petroleum. Buffett boosted his stake in the energy giant to 25.8 percent, snapping up almost 4 million common shares, giving him a total of 228 million shares in the oil giant. Now, his total stake in the company now sits at about $14.5 billion. Well, it's been a gangbuster quarter for the U.S. economy, GDP rising by 4.9 percent during the third quarter, powered by the consumer that stands resilient in the face of inflation. Though soaring bond yields may have done some of the Fed's work for it, it's clear stubborn inflation has a ways to go before the Fed hits its 2 percent goal. So what can we expect from the Fed next week? But joining me now is John McLean, Brandywine Global Portfolio Manager. Good to have you on the show here. So give us your expectations here. I mean, we're, we're about 18 months in of interest rate hikes and pauses here. What are the expectations coming into the next meeting? Well, you hit the nail on the head with your introduction here. GDP is strong, the consumer is strong, uh, inflation is coming down, but not as quickly as the Fed would like. I don't think we're going to see uh, any surprises in the next meeting here. I mean, we're not hiking uh, this time around, but I do think that there's the potential for an additional hike uh, to be coming into the market probably in December. And I think the Fed's going to have to talk tough at this point because the uh, economy is strong, because equity markets, despite the, the recent sell-off, are still performing reasonably well. Um, you know, the Fed's got a lot of work to do here, and it's fighting uh, fiscal stimulus as well at this point. And in terms of the tools that the Fed is using, you noted that COVID didn't kill the U.S. economy. In fact, it structurally altered it. What does that mean then for the Fed's approach as it's looking at the strength of the economy at the moment and still in this high interest rate environment and inflation still sticky? Yeah, I mean, the Fed can't act alone in isolation, right? And I think, uh, as we mentioned, you know, you've got a cocktail of financial engineering, loose fiscal policy, stimulative go government programs uh, that have all been counteracting what the Fed's doing. And also, I don't think it's talked about enough at this point in time, but the Fed's balance sheet's massive. It's massive relative to GDP and relative to its historical uh, positioning here, and that's still very stimulative. So uh, the Fed used to have kind of the lay of the landscape from, and you know, monetary policy had a strong transmission mechanism. It's not the case today. They're fighting a lot of counterbalancing forces. And, you know, people are looking at their retirement, they're looking at their 401k, and you know, you know, the, the Fed does not care about your 401k at the moment. At what point does that narrative change, though? Well, Jay Powell, Scrooge McDuck, right? Like, yes, he de definitely does not care about the stock market or the 401k. And I think that's a misnomer that a lot of people thought that the Fed stepped in in March of 20 as the stock market was crashing. That was not why they came in at all. They came in to restore order to uh, fixed income markets, particularly treasuries. You could not trade treasuries for a point in time, basically, during the depths of COVID. And that's what the Fed cares about. It's uh, orderly financial markets. They don't care about the stock market. And really, uh, we would be massively far away from a Fed put at this point in time. And of course, I have to ask you about the action that we've been seeing with bond yields and the impact that's been having on stocks, that, that dichotomy there. What are your projections for, for where this goes from here? I mean, we're going to be in this holding pattern of higher for longer interest rates, clearly for the foreseeable future. Yeah, and we, we said that. And this is, look, this is a generational opportunity for investors to shift capital away from equity into fixed income. The relative attractiveness of fixed income compared to equity markets is as strong as it's been in 20 plus years. Uh, you know, what we think is uh, areas of the market that are relatively short duration are particularly interesting at this point in time. So we highlight high yield at nine and a half percent yield is forming kind of a Goldilocks opportunity for investors with uh, low default rates, uh, low dollar price bonds and high yields. Uh, you know, the longer part of the Treasury curve is particularly challenging at this point. Uh, what we're watching closely here is where the 10 year closes. And if we close above 5 percent at a point in time, I think that could potentially lead to a real blow off in uh, back end yields. We could see yields jump massively here. And what you got to pay attention to is the ineptitude of Washington, D.C. at this point. You've got politicians that, uh, you know, it takes three weeks and, uh, you know, four speakers to elect, uh, elect the new speaker. Um, so, you know, I, I think 
we're going to have to wait and see around fiscal discipline coming out of D.C. because if we don't have that fiscal discipline, you could see a material rise in uh, back end interest rates. And certainly, I mean, when you have a, a new speaker now who is, you know, he's pro-Trump and it's going to be a, a tough sell here to try and get some sort of to avoid a government shutdown here. When you couple that also with what we've seen, as you mentioned, there with the inverted yield curve, when you couple that with a potential recession, then what are your recession estimates? How deep do you think it's going to be and what could potentially change that narrative? Well, look, we were early to uh, a recession call in 2023, and I think uh, as we briefly mentioned, financial engineering and creativity from CFOs has really prolonged this cycle. And I don't think we're going to see a recession in the next 12 months here. So I think it's continued to be pushed out. Um, you know, but in terms of uh, where we see bond yields going, you know, again, the back end of the curve is relatively murky, but the front end of the curve is reasonably, uh, if not uh, particularly attractive. And what else do you find attractive in this sort of environment? I know we talked about um, fixed income here. So what are some of your favorite picks at the moment? Well, again, from an asset class perspective, we like to stay relatively short because the curve, uh, while it's inverted, has gotten less inverted. So we want to take some duration, which means rotating a bit out of floating rate and into high yield. Uh, we find a lot of value in the mortgage market. Mortgages are exceedingly cheap, uh, but they're cheap for a reason until... The Fed comes in and buys until banks buy. Uh, mortgages are going to remain uh, relatively cheap. But if you're a buy and hold investor and you have a five to 10 year time horizon, fantastic opportunity there. Investment grade corporates are, are, are reasonable at this point as well. Uh, so there's a lot to like uh, in fixed income. And, and from our perspective on the equity side of things, look, you're trading at 19, 20 times PE and the cost of capital has gone up 500 basis points over the last 18 months. And so that cash flow. Uh, is going to be servicing debt as opposed to paying dividends and share buybacks. So again, you know, we think the relative trade is out of equity and into uh, fixed income across a number of different asset classes. And especially still in the thick of earnings season here, is that giving you any sort of expectations as we're looking ahead to the following quarter? Earnings are coming in fine, right? Like, I, I think when you look at the Magnificent Seven, you know, some of the generals are starting to get shot here a little bit, but it's not based on the fundamentals of the business based on longer term expectations uh, as well as valuation. So I think what we're seeing generically is reasonable earnings from these companies. And what I would point to and why we're so constructive on corporate credit is the fact that these companies have had 18 months uh, to figure out their balance sheets and they're seeing rising interest costs and they're not borrowing which is uh, fantastic and very supportive for, for debt holders. But earnings ex expectations, I think, are reasonable at this point in time. They're going to start to come down as we see the impacts of uh, rising interest expense on corporate uh, EPS. But it's going to take a lot longer than I think uh, the, the, the market anticipates. I'll certainly be watching that. appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. John McLean, Brandywine Global Portfolio Manager. Thank you so much. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. 2023 rocked the markets. NVIDIA, the stock has been on a tear. Silicon this Valley week. Bank's collapse is the second largest bank failure in the U.S. Inflation, mortgage rates, the diabetes drug, Ozempic. Now it's time to make bold decisions. Yahoo Finance Invest, the marquee event for investors seeking big ideas and bold decisions. Guided by the newsroom you trust. Don't miss it November 7th, exclusively on Yahoo Finance.
We've got a deal, maybe. The UAW and Ford have tentatively reached an agreement after nearly six weeks of strikes. But what does this mean for auto stocks? Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery to offer some insights into what we might see. Hey, Jared, having just one of the three here uh, reaching a tentative deal, what does that then signal? Yes, this is very good news. Uh, it puts pressure on GM and Stellantis to hammer out a deal. I read reports uh, Ford workers are returning, at least some of them, to their plants today. But I want to go over some of the numbers here to estimate what kind of profit hit these companies are going to take as a result of this strike. And to do that, let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive. First, I'm going to show you a historical precedent. This is the last time we got a major strike uh, with the UAW. This was 2019. This was a 40-day strike. And estimates at the time were that GM was going to take a hit of $50 million per day for a total cost, um, which would have been not known in the early days, but total cost of $2 billion ended up being twice that. So estimates were pretty low. The high end of estimates had said $100 million per day. And that was, in fact, what it ended up being, 3.8 to $4 billion in a total EBIT hit. That's earnings before interest and taxes. Just one way of uh, measuring profit here. Now, to bring it to the current, uh, we have here JP Morgan with some estimates of the hit that GM would take. And first, going back to September, which is still in Q3, the estimates were for $21 million a day. You do the math and it comes out to $191 million. In Q4, that has not changed. Uh, JP Morgan saying they still expect that to extend for any number of days, however long this, uh, this occurs, $21 million a day. I did the math bringing it current through today. It's $546 million for Q4. Bottom line, $737 million is the estimated total loss if workers were to return tomorrow. Now, for Ford, it's going to be a little bit more. And that's because as of October 12th, uh, Ford workers in their very profitable Kentucky plant joined the other striking uh, workers. And the increase they saw, so the total cost was estimated at $18 million per day. That jumped up to $44 million per day. Bottom line, what is the bottom line? It looks like this is costing Ford workers a total of $1 billion. I said at least some of the workers are returning today, so uh, you can adjust the math accordingly there. But I, these are just estimates. Um, and as we learned from the prior GM episode, these can be quite light. Now, I just want to show you what's been happening to the stock over this time period. Here's the here's our, our car maker automobile vehicle maker heat map. This is what's going on today. You'll notice that Ford is down 1.1%, GM down about 1.5%. Ford actually gave a little bit of a pop in the opening minutes here. That was given up. I should note the general market is under pressure, so that could be accounting for some of the negative price action that we're seeing here. And here's General Motors, which also started out in the green, now down 1.5%. But here's what's happened over the last month. You can see uh, Ford down 8%, GM down 11%. But guess what? Tesla, which is not exposed to the UAW uh, strike at all, that's down almost 15%. So kind of depends on how you look at this. I don't know that the stock uh, stocks have fully incorporated um, what's known about the strike. And plus, you have all the other macro variables going along here. But uh, just to bring it back to the current, uh, it is nice that a deal looks like it's finally being hammered out and that Ford is kind of jump-starting uh, negotiations, which will be continued with GM and Stellantis over the weekend, likely. Indeed, something that we were wondering how this would all end, at least tentatively, Ford at least, seeing some progress here. Appreciate that update. Thank you, Jared. Well, after nearly six weeks of striking, the United Auto Workers Union and Ford have come to that tentative agreement. Now, the union says the deal includes 25 percent wage increases over the course of four years, adjustments for cost of living and additional job security. Negotiations still continue between the UAW and General Motors and Stellantis. General Motors CFO Paul Jacobson spoke with our own executive editor, Brian Sozzi, about the lasting impact of the strike. It is going to take some work. Uh, there, there's no doubt this is going to create some inflationary pressure, and uh, we're going to do our best to make sure that it doesn't disrupt us from our targets. But that requires us signing a deal that we know we can be competitive with um, in the future. Well, let's bring in Autoblog Editor-in-Chief Greg Miglior to discuss this more. So, Greg, first, talk about what this means then. Now that Ford has reached this tentative agreement, what does this mean for GM and Stellantis and the pressure that it puts on them. 
Hey, good morning. So this is an unquestioned victory for the UAW. They got a good chunk of what they were actually asking for in these negotiations. And now for Ford, this is basically over. The workers are already being told to go back to work. Uh, so that restarts very important factories that build like the Ranger, the Bronco, the Super Duty. Uh, and that's a competitive advantage for Ford at this point. Now, if you're sitting in a C-suite uh, for General Motors or Stellantis, you realize you're down factories, you're down inventory, critical vehicles are not being produced. So at this point, you know the other two of the Detroit three are going to be looking to make a deal. And the pattern essentially is there at this point. 25% wage increase with COLA, it gets up to over 30%. Uh, a lot of, you know, I would say, touchstones that the UAW was looking for, uh, they were able to get from Ford. And also, I think it's a fairly livable deal for Ford, too. The original, you know, numbers we heard were like a 40% increase over the length of the contract. Uh, it seems like through negotiation, they were able to kind of bring that down a little bit. They made some concessions in other areas. And, you know, to me, it seems like perhaps in the next few days over the weekend, Ford and Stellantis are going to be very motivated to get this done. And so, Greg, what's the mood like on the ground there among auto workers? Because this was about sort of making up for a lot of the concessions they made during the financial crisis, as well as future proofing some of the advancements and investments that these companies are making in EVs. So if you go back 15, 16 years during you know, the start of the Great Recession, the UAW did you know, give a lot of concessions to the Detroit Three to try to make those companies viable at the time. Uh, fast forward you know, 15 years, and Sean Fain, the UAW president, said, hey, uh, it's time for, you know, the companies to try to, you know, reverse that, if you will, and make it more of a, a level playing field. So I think they did that. And I think they also were able to make it so it does appear to be a sustainable business model going forward. I know there's been a lot of concern about labor costs, but one of the interesting things about the, the UAW deal is now the Detroit Three, pretty soon, will know what their labor costs are for the next four plus years. That's not true in many other industries. And so when people look back and they look at how Sean Fain really negotiated this, and as you know, sort of played the big three against each other, how does this, you think, set the stage for how perhaps other unions or how perhaps other auto companies might move forward in, in, with similar situations? I think it was a masterful job. I think he sensed that the mood uh, to support labor in this country has never been higher, starting right in the Oval Office uh, and on both sides of the aisle. So I think he tried to capture a moment and use it as leverage to get as much as he could out of the uh, the negotiations. I think he did a good job of doing a, it was a national strike, but it was targeted factories. So the interesting nuance there is most UAW workers were actually working during the strike. It was just they were picking and choosing different factories, which allowed the UAW to get maximum leverage, uh, maximum negotiating position, and also, I think, probably get the best deal they could. And so then in terms of, you know, if the vote goes forward and it's successful and the deal is finalized, what are the next steps in terms of the impact on the industry? How long does it take after a strike this long and so targeted to get a lot of these uh, production lines back up and running? So from what I've heard, some of the Ford factories are already people are going back to them like today. So, uh, you know, Ford, General Motors, Stellantis have been making cars and trucks and SUVs for close to 100 years, more than that in Ford's case. Uh, they know what they're doing, and it's actually somewhat of a reasonable task to just restart production. So that's going to, uh, I think, happen in pretty short order. I think going forward, uh, both sides will have you know clear structured labor costs for the next four and a half years. Uh, I think they'll have some clarity. Uh, we'll get we don't know all of the details of the agreement, but we'll get some more clarity on you know what battery plants might be included into it, and um, you know. Frankly, this is about to be over with, I think. You know, it's one of those things where you look back at the 2019 General Motors strike, which was almost all, which was all General Motors factories. Uh, this one, it seems like accomplished a bit more for the union. Certainly for there, at least laying out the blueprint for, for the other two to follow. Appreciate that update. Autoblog Editor-in-Chief Greg Miglior, thank you so much.
All right, taking a look at Hershey stock under a little bit of pressure this morning after initially popping on Q3 earnings. The candy maker beat expectations on the top and bottom line with $3.03 billion in revenue and adjusted earnings per share of $2.60. So what could be spooking investors then? Joining us now with insights from the earnings call is Yahoo Finance reporter Brooke De Palma. So Brooke, are weight loss drugs to blame for this dip? That's a great question, Rochelle. It's definitely something that has been spooking investors as of late. But one analyst that I spoke to said that really it's the confectionery business at large that has slowed down in the third quarter. And Hershey's is also facing increased competition. Hershey's also did not reaffirm its prior 2024 preliminary outlook that called for high-end growth. And all that in culmination with that recent fear of weight loss drugs on the street that could have or potentially could have consumers pulling back on snacking due to the effects of these drugs. If you take a look at the last three months, shares of Hershey's are down more than 22%. And in the last month, shares are down 8%. And on the call, one analyst did ask about how Hershey's is preparing for this scenario as it plays out. CEO Michelle Buck weighed in. It certainly is very early days. Um, you know, we don't believe the GLP ones are having a material impact on our business at this point in time. And I think we all know there's a lot of data coming out. There's still so many unknowns re regarding the rate of adoption, the impact on food choices, you know, the, the medium to longer term impacts um, on consumers. And we're doing more work constantly to understand those future potential impacts um, on our categories. But one thing that Michelle did note is this emotional nature about the Hershey's brands that keeps consumers coming back, especially around the holidays. Think Halloween around the corner. They did add that they plan to continue to adapt the portfolio to meet consumers' needs, whether it be products, ingredients, or pack sizes. And so, Brooke, then what were some of the other takeaways that you heard from Hershey's third quarter earnings call? Yeah, Rochelle. Well, let's kick off first with Halloween being on Tuesday. That was definitely a big focus on the call. They said that Hershey's retail sales in terms of Halloween sales are winning shares so far. They said that they're slightly up from last year and are outperforming the category. But one caveat here is given that Halloween is on a Tuesday, many consumers are waiting to shop until this weekend. And so they'll have a better read on that next quarter. Also, with more availability compared to last year, consumers aren't too worried about waiting until this weekend. But what they are seeing is a shift to more filling, saltier snacks. They said while pretzel category is performing well, that ready-to-eat popcorn and puffs category is slowing considerably. They said that consumers are looking to get a bigger bang for their buck. They're looking for more value. So think meat snacks, tortilla chips, and some things that are a bit more filling. And lastly, the company added that they have less availability on 2024 uh, cocoa pricing. We know that cocoa futures have been on the rise year to date and compared to a year ago. They said that that won't fundamentally change pricing next year, but it is something that they're keeping a closer look at. Appreciate you getting us up to speed there. Our very own Brooke De Palma. Thank you so much. Well, crypto has been at the forefront for lawmakers for months. This morning, the Senate Banking Committee convened to discuss risks surrounding digital currency and how it could play a role in terrorism around the globe, especially in light of the Israel-Hamas conflict. Well, joining me now is Republican Senator of Wyoming, Cynthia Lummis, to discuss more. Good to see you again, Senator. So talk about some of the findings that we've seen here, because I know that Crypto and digital assets were part of the discussion about illicit financing, but how much of it is represented here in the illicit funding? Uh, Rochelle, thank you. It's nice to be with you. It, it, it's a small part of the overall funding, but the fact that it is a part of the funding is what makes it of interest to me and of concern to me. We know that Binance has been used uh, to uh, funnel monies and contributions to Hamas. Uh, so it's absolutely important uh, that we have these uh, heretofore unregulated companies in the United States um, come into our system, be regulated, uh, that they um, vet their uh, customers, uh, that they comply with the Bank Secrecy Act, that we have uh, efforts through FinCEN and other means 
uh, to stop uh, the use of uh, cryptocurrencies in illicit finance. We know it's being used. Uh, it's it's a, to a smaller degree than perhaps was reported in the Wall Street dur- Journal, but nevertheless, we know it's being used. We have screenshots of uh, Binance's logo on solicitations for illicit finance. So then, Senator, how do you close some of the gaps and, and the loopholes here that are allowing some of these, these countries and, the, and these uh, users to circumvent sanctions and some of the existing policies? Uh, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand and I have a comprehensive bill called the Finan- Responsible Financial Innovation Act that would provide additional resources to FinCEN, uh, would call for a study uh, of the use of mixers and tumblers. We also know that Treasury is already uh, doing some good work to begin that effort uh, regarding the use of mixers and tumblers to um, uh, secure anonymity uh, in illicit finance. Uh, we need to make sure that the Justice Department, when we have known violations, uh, Binance, Tether, uh, and other uses where they have, it's been told to them that their uh, customers are using uh, their platforms for illicit finance, uh, and then they'll take them down for a short period of time, uh, and then those sites go back up. These are the kind of things that need to be policed in the United States by U.S. regulators. The Lummis Gillibrand bill will augment uh, those efforts, those resources, and make sure Uh, that countries that have the reach of U.S. regulation are complying with the Bank Secrecy Act um, and the Anti-Terrorism Act. We have a portion of our bill in the National Defense Authorization Act that already passed the Senate. We want to make sure that that part stays in the final product. We've got to get at the illicit finance use uh, of cryptocurrency. And certainly will require some international cooperation as well as as some of these transactions, essentially borderless. Um, We do appreciate you taking the time to join us, Senator Cynthia Lummis, Republican Senator of Wyoming. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, before we go, let's give you a quick check of the markets. As we can see here, red across the board here, all three major indices under pressure. The Dow here currently selling off a little bit more than it was this morning, down about a third of a percent. S&P 500, they're also under pressure, down about 28 points or 0.7 percent. Looking at the tech-heavy Nasdaq there, also down about 1 percent on the day or about 153 points. Seeing the magnificent seven tech stocks under some pressure this morning here, as we've also seen some action with the bond markets as well and that revision there for GDP coming in stronger than expected showing that resiliency and perhaps a little more room for the Fed to do a bit more work here without doing too much damage to the economy. So we'll be keeping an eye on that for you. Well that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Okutha. I'll be back with you at 11am Eastern. I'll see you then.